2-88 for the property located at 1728 West Powhatan Avenue. The petitioner in this case is Aldo Lopez. Mr. Lopez had requested um, of the BRB to reduce his west side yard setback. Ms. Valdez, please excuse me, I do apologize. We had a motion made by Councilman Mascot, oh. seconded by Councilman Goods to open the 130 hearing. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Yes, okay. If I may just start over, and the interpreter has asked me to slow down a little bit too, so I will. <laughs> I will start over um, with my presentation. Council members, Susan Johnson Velez, again, Legal Department. This is item number 64. It is a petition for review from VRB case number 22 88 for property located at 1728 West Powhatan Avenue. The petitioner is Aldo Lopez. Mr. Lopez had filed an application with the Variance Review Board requesting to reduce his west side yard setback from seven feet to zero feet. The Variance Review Board denied the application request on December 13th, 2022, and they did cite uh, several reasons for the denial. Um, first, the VRB denied the request because the applicant did not meet his burden of proof to provide competent substantial evidence of a hardship. The applicant performed work without permits, therefore, to the extent there was a hardship, the hardship was self-created. Um, third, the applicant is able to solve his drainage issues on his property without a 13-foot wide by 60-foot wide carport. Um, fourth, there was already a carport on the property and the concern over the fact that the variance would remain in place on this property forever. Um, I did provide council with uh, packets uh, containing rules of procedure for this hearing. Two code sections, 27-61, which provide the um, process for review of a board decision that council is undertaking this afternoon. Um, code section 27-80, which provides the guidelines for application of the variance power and specifically the criteria that the variance review board applied to this request. And then finally, sample motions um, for you to use at the end of this hearing. The standard of review in this case is provided in section 27-61J3 of the code. The, the city council will apply a de novo standard of review, which means that city council is not limited in its review to information, documentation, or evidence which the variance review application was based. City council shall follow all applicable ordinances in arriving in its decision and City Council may receive new evidence at this hearing this afternoon. In a moment, uh, Ms. Jane Madu with staff will present an, a further overview of the application and the decision. And then following the hearing, City Council may take uh, one of several actions after hearing the evidence. City Council may affirm the VRB decision and deny the request to reduce the west side yard setback from seven feet to zero feet City Council may affirm the decision with additional conditions, which you must get agreement from the property owner before you impose. Um, City Council may remand the matter back to the VRB for further proceedings with specific direction to the VRB indicating the basis for remand. And then fourth and finally, City Council may overturn the VRB decision and grant the request to reduce the west side yard setback from seven feet to zero feet. I'm happy to take any questions if council has any at this time. If not, I would turn it over to Ms. Madhu. Any questions for Ms. Johnson Velez? Mr. Shelby. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Clerk, uh, the interpreter. Um, have you sworn in the interpreter as, as of yet? Uh, could we have the interpreter sworn in? Please. What? Everybody pray. What? You have to do both. Both. Right, I'm going to be both lawyers and stuff. Okay, very good. All right, I'll be the translator. Please swear on firm that the translation that you will be providing will be accurate and complete. I do. Thank you. And would you, I'm sorry, would you just give your name for the record? Rudolph Campbell. Do you have that? I don't know if that made the, the, um, the tape. You have it? Okay, thank you. Everyone else that's provided testimony, please stand and raise your right hand. Yes. Thank you. 
and also council please uh, receive uh, and file any ex parte written documents pursuant to Florida statutes. We have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Second. Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Good. Yes, you sir. You said that according to the application to the Grand Review Board, uh, the outcome was that the petitioner created the hardship himself. Is that correct? Correct. This, the work on this carport and the construction was done without permits. That's correct. So it wasn't something that was done there before, we tried to change, but the actual petitioner did the work creating his own hardship, correct? That is what the Variance Review Board found, sir. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. And so now I'll turn it over to Ms. Madhu, and just I would remind uh, Ms. Madhu to speak a little bit more slowly than she might otherwise so that the interpreter can interpret for the applicant. And Mr. Chairman, I would ask that council, when they make their comments, they also please take into account to speak slower and perhaps into the microphone so that the interpreter is able to hear clearly. Thank you. Can you hear us? You're muted. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, City Council. I'm trying to share my screen. Um, okay. <clears throat> Is my presentation up? Not quite, we're almost there. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Jane Amadi and I am with Development Coordination and I will be presenting the case for VRB 2288C that is before you for appeal. Uh, the property owner is Aldo Lopez and the property is addressed at 1728 West Powhatan Avenue. This is zoned RS60, which is a residential single family zoning. They went before the variance uh, board with the request to reduce the west side yard setback from seven feet to zero feet. And this is for an existing cop board. The code section in reference is section 27-156 that has the schedule of area, height, bulk, and placement for the RS-60 zoning district as 25 feet for the front, 20 feet for the rear, and seven feet on the sides. The criteria for the approval or denial of a variance request is found in section 27-80, and this is the criteria that the board used in determining the variance request that was presented before it. Um, one talks about the alleged hardship, Two talks about the practical difficulty and that this would not be a self-created hardship. Three is whether it interferes with the health and safety of others. And four, that is in harmony with the intent of the City of Tampa Code and the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. And five, that this will result in substantial justice for the applicant and um, the public. The Variance Review Board heard this case on December 13, 2022, and after testimony denied um, the request 521 uh, to reduce the west side yard setback from seven feet to zero. This is the subject property uh, in the orange um, dotted um, square or rectangle in this case. It is an interior lot that is located in the USF Institutional Planning District. This uh, was work that was done without permit as um, um, Susan Johnson Velez has already stated and they were cited and this variance was in order to bring the property into compliance. This is a site plan that the applicant provided. This is the existing one single, fa um, single family residence and to the west side here is where we have the cop court that is um, under this variance request. The applicant provided pictures of the existing conditions. So this is the carport and that is the fence towards the side. And um, this is a gate that goes, um, opens and closes um, in front of that carport. 
the applicant also provided pictures showing um, what was uh, their hardship with regards to runoff water and um, coming from the neighbor's property into their own property. And these were pictures that they, sh they provided to show um, the damage that was done to their property from um, that runoff water. And if you have any questions, uh, I would be available. I'll be on standby. Any questions for staff? Seeing none. Petitioner. Um, good afternoon. I am the daughter of Aldo Lopez, and I am here on his behalf to try to explain the reasons why they built the carport without the proper set size setback and kindly request you, your reconsideration for approval of the existing uh, structure. I brought some more pictures, but first I would like to also mention that this property was built in 1957 and the exterior material is frame and the foundation is crawl space. And we are surrounded by three houses, uh, one on each side and one on the back. Um, they're each built at a higher level than ours, so um, leaving us stuck in the fall of the water between the three houses. Uh, the carport and the gutters guide the water to the street city drain and prevent the rainwater to get into the neighbor's yard. Um, we also built it as far as possible from the house to protect the walls and prevent the water coming below the main house. And before the carport, which was the main issue, is that the water uh, ran below our house and it will stay there for days. And sometimes my dad, he had to manually take that water out. And otherwise it will bring a lot of humidity below the house. And because of the crawl space uh, foundation, they were afraid of the possibility of creating mold in the house since it's old and it's wood. Um, also the family, especially my mom and my brother, they suffer from allergies. Among them are some types of mold in addition to the fact that um, they they're also asthmatic and humidity does not help with their condition. I also brought some papers of this, if you would like to see them, of their allergies. Um, Okay. So basically, that was that's the main reason why we built the carport and why we really need to keep not only the carport, but keep it the way it is uh, with the length that it was built. Uh, I would like to show some pictures to show how the structure works, if that's possible. Okay, the pictures are on mm -hmm. the overhead projector right there to yeah. your right. Yeah. As you can see, the house is in, um, it has a, a, a nice view, you know, it's not, English is not my first language, so I'm here as a friend just to help the family. What is your name and my what name, relationship do you have? Anna Gloria Acosta, I'm friend of the family. Okay. Did you want to say something? What? Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, as you can see, um, it's a uh, house, the, the level of the surrounding houses are higher than, than the, the, the house in fact. Also, the way that the carport was built is in, is, is, is a nice uh, Can you lower building. that just a little yes, bit, please? It's nice, it was built correctly. Um, the only thing that they do, didn't take into consideration was the size setback. That's why we are here to, again, kindly request from you, you know, be seeing the, ne the necessary, um, uh, to keep it the way that it is with the necessary, with the length uh, away from the main house. Um, because uh, oh, we have some more pictures showing, this is the interior. Mm -hmm. That's the drain right there. And there was an existing drain in this side of the house, but it's not enough um, to keep the water away when it rains a lot. I we bring some more. This is shows one of the houses uh, un uneven, uneven level, mm -hmm. you know. 
and this is also the other side of the house that is higher. And as you can see on this picture, the water is, some, even though with the carport, it gets into the, the driveway. So, and this is the crawl space that it will go, it will stay the water if, if we don't keep the, the carport the length from okay. the main house that is right now. Yeah, with the water and the, I mean, with the gutters and the carport, it really helps guide the water into that uh, drain, which takes it out of the house, but still sometimes there's still water accumulating in there like we saw in the other picture, even when the drain and the carport made. But that has really helped um, keep that water out. Senorita Slumbly, your name? My name, Diana, Diana Lopez. Diana Lopez, Yes. You. And um, I would like to end this presentation by emphasizing that this carport is not it's not in any way a nuisance to any of the people who call this neighborhood home, especially the two families at both of my sides who have strongly supported us by letters. I have like six or five letters here uh, from them. In fact, the neighbor who will be the most affected by this carport uh, is right here. His name is Rafael Morero. Um, he's been living in, the, in his house for 30 years and he's here showing his support and please note that the genuine intent for keeping this carport is just a, a father's urge to protect his home and his children's health overall. And finally, we would like to tell you that it was never our intention to disregard the city's laws in any way, um, which is why we respectfully urge you to allow us to keep this carport that is extremely beneficial to us as a family. It also contributes to the value of a real estate, to the appearance of the neighborhood overall, and it does not harm our neighbors at all. That would be it. Does that conclude your presentation? Yes, thank you. Okay. That's one heard that. Um, when did your family purchase the home? Um, six years ago. Six years ago? December 20th. Uh, it was 2016, December. And where does the water go now? We saw the, wh where does it go from there? It goes to the drain, to the, from that drain that we showed, it goes straight to the city drain, in the street. In the street, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Any other questions? Johnson Bless, you coming up to speak? Okay. It, that's one her tap. Um, can can we have the letters? Yes. Uh, do you also need the um, the papers of my mother's asthma? Is there anyone in chambers that wishes to speak uh, to this? Any public comment? No one is registered. Do you, Councilman Moran? Let me ask a question. Uh, I see more than the carport, the, the front <clears throat> U-shape, all the concrete, was that permitted or is that part of this deal or not? El carport. Sí, sí. No, el yeah. cemento. El cemento. Eso es, es un proceso que viene después, ¿verdad? Sí. Yes, we, we have applied for the permit, but currently they won't let us keep going with the application until we resolve the carport issue. Well, if I may ask counselors permission, let me speak to you in another language. La parte de la casa está todo con... Well, he, per he, he can listen. He can listen. He listen to you. He can listen to Mike. I'll speak to the interpreter. La parte de la casa, de frente a la casa para la calle, que tiene cemento en tres cuartos de la parte. Mr. Miranda. ¿Tiene permiso o no? En este momento no. At this moment. It, this. Miss, Miss Johnson, for less, please. Could you just want to just. What? If we can, could we have the interpreter, please? Sir, could you step up to the microphone? And could we have the gentleman, could we have the gentleman, the petitioner, and if you could state his name, please? 
Okay, give right. us a number, please, Owen. See, what's the name? My name is Aldo Lopez. This is for the Owen for the home. 1728 for her. Okay, now if we can, if the, Mr. Interpreter. Yes, sir. If you could hear Mr. Miranda's question in English, if you could translate that to Spanish, and Mr. Miranda will be listening to make sure you do it correctly. What? <laughs> what? Yeah, he's got, yeah, so, right, so I, he needs to, I know. Exactly. So Mr. Miranda needs to request, um, I, I, I request that Mr. Miranda, you ask the question for the purposes of the record. Ask the question in English. The translator will translate it to Spanish. The gentleman will respond to the interpreter, and then you will answer in English for the purposes of the record, that being translated. Are we clear? Thank you. So Mr. Miranda, if you could just repeat the question that you asked in uh, Spanish. If you could uh, ask in English. The, the, we, I, I see two things that I saw from the video, from the presentation of the uh, camera that was on, on two pieces of uh, a photograph. Uh, one was the carport, and the other one was the front of the house. It has a U shape where you have the, the uh, place where the postman or post lady picks up the mail, and you have a big U there, all of concrete. Was that there prior to the purchasing of the house, or that was that done here recently after the house was purchased? Así que lo que vi en la presentación, uh, en cuanto al video, las fotos que se tomaron, que había dos porciones que se encuentran ahí. Uh, la primera tiene que ver con el cubre coche, garaje abierto, uh -huh. y la otra en cuanto a la parte de frente, donde hay una sección U uh, que está concreto, hecho de concreto, y eso, esto es algo que se hizo uh, después o antes que ustedes hicieron or pidieron permisos para hacerlo, o fue algo hecho antes o después que compraron la casa? Sí. Eh, primeramente, quise decirle que yo estoy de acuerdo que no pedí permiso para, para ninguna de las dos cosas por desconocimiento. If you could break, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you could break it up, it makes it easier if you could do it in sections. I think it would be. Sí, puede hablar, responder en frases cortas. Oh, sí. 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 Uh, respond in short phrases. Once I interpret, then he can continue. Is that okay. fine with the council? So I just want to say, in um, regards to both things, I didn't ask for any permits, and that was just to not having knowledge. El cemento fue después de cup. And the cement was done after the purchase. Okay. Then the next question is, although this case is about the carport, the front of the house is also in violation. Am I correct? Así que todo lo que tiene que ver con el sobrecoche y también la parte de frente de la casa también está en violación. Sí, correcto. Yes, yo, correct. yo, yo tengo el permiso. All of this hearing is, I guess, based only on the carport. There's evidence that there's another part of the house that's also in violation and violating the storm uh, water drainage that we passed the tax on about, about six, seven, eight years ago where you're going to have percolation for the water to go down into the to the grass and sand area because of that, the city of Tampa is taking all the water and it's committed to only take so much water because of the true sherry treatment plant and things that we need to do. All right, I'll stop. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm going too fast. I, I'll go back. Hay dos partes de este caso. Uno que está en en violento del, del contrato de la ciudad que tiene con todo el mundo que tiene que hacer cosas con permiso, número sí. uno. Mr. Sí. Miranda, I'm sorry. If you can, Mr. Translator. I'll do it in English then. Thank you. And he can turn. What I see here is a violation of two things. One that is charged with, that was a carport, but I don't know how they, whoever did the, the, the work up on this contract failed to realize that the front of the house is also in violation because that concrete is not supposed to be 95% all the way concrete up to the, where the post person picks up the mail and delivers the mail in a buzón, in the mailbox. So, así que hay dos violaciones envueltos en esto. La primera tiene que ver con el cubrecoche, uh, pero también la parte donde una camina hacia la casa, esta parte enfrente tampoco, uh, aunque no se hizo con permiso, pero no debía tener un concreto hasta el 95% desde la calle hasta donde, perdón, donde, de la casa hasta donde se recoge el, el correo, sea por eh, la persona del correo o la, 
Sí. Al señor de Correo. Sí, mira, yo he ido al City varias veces, he colaborado con ellos bastante. Eh, el, tengo el permiso para el cemento, pero con, con lo que tengo que cortar, pero no, no, lo me, han, no me han permitido hacerlo hasta que termine el campo. En el campo. Sí, dale, por favor. So I've tried to cooperate with the city and, uh, a lot. I've gone there many, several times. And so the permission, uh, permits that I've been asking for with the concrete uh, to cut it, uh, I haven't been able to uh, get that because I have to attend this matter of the carport. Déjame hacer otra cosa, por favor. La aplicación que hice para la, lo que está puesto aquí, la variante, yo todo el tiempo he estado pensando que ese es el permiso para el campo. Ese ha sido el problema para mí para entenderlo. Si no, yo hace rato hubiera tomado una medida sobre eso, pero yo, yo he pensado que esa aplicación de la variancia era el permiso. So this application that I'm making for the vari variation is, is something that I thought the whole time uh, was going to be uh, just for finishing up with the carport. I thought it was the permit, not for the application. Otherwise, I would have taken care of all this already. I'm not here personally to consider two violations because you only charged with one, but I just want to know the background of the other one. And evidently, it's also in violation, but he was never charged with that. So I'm only looking at the one now on the carport because the other one you can't charge if they, if they didn't have a charge against them. So I'm not a court enforcement officer at the same time. However, it's important for us to understand that that water's got to go down so it recharges the aquifer to come back up again somewhere else. But we can't continue doing the things that we want to do just because we want to do them. It might be fine when you're thinking about what you need for yourself, but I don't know what city they come from. This is a little different. I'm not blaming them. They were naive to the point, but that's just a question that I had to ask for my own self. And all I know, I'm only considering the carport I had to ask for the whole thing to find out what happened, how it happened, and when it happened. Mr. T. Yes. Así que parece que hay dos violaciones. Personalmente se empezó una carga en cuanto una, uh, pero yo quería solamente hablar de la una porque yo no más quería este uh, información de fondo en cuanto uh, la El primer cargo, porque aunque se ha presentado uh, pruebas al respecto del segundo, no se ha presentado una cargo, solamente estoy mirando okay. uh, una. Así que yo no soy un oficial de que haga, con, que, las, haga que las personas cumplen con las leyes de la ciudad, pero es importante que solamente se acepta cierta cantidad de agua en los aquifers para que se pueda recargar el agua para que sube en otro lugar. Así que no podemos seguir haciendo lo que nos da la gana y lo que, uh, lo que nosotros queremos. Uh, necesitamos uh, cumplir con lo que se ha permitido por la ciudad y eso es lo que quería uh, yo saber y dejarles saber que solamente me estoy enfocando en la única violación okay. aquí. And, and, I'm, I'm finished. Uh, just a, a point, uh, Mr. Miranda and the rest of council, just to let you know that that the staff member okay. is also, um, I, I don't recall her name, but she is available for you online. And if you like to ask staff questions related to this case, that that person is available. Yeah, I didn't know that. I, I, I like to ask the staff person the same thing. He's not charged with two violations, he's charged with one, am I correct? If she could turn on the camera, please. Is she there? Can I? Wait. Yes, I'm here. Okay, it could, could we, there she goes. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so um, the applicant, the applicant is charged with but the code violation is both for the driveway and the carport. And because of the violation, there is a lock on his address. And that lock means he can't pull any permits until he fixes the issue with the carport. So he does have a permit trying to fix the driveway, but he can't do that until he has fix the issue with the carport, which is the side yard setback. Um, he's encroaching into that side yard setback. And that's why he um, is, he went before the variance board. Uh, when he did 
go before the variance board, the only request he had was for the COP board. So the variance board would only address the request that is presented before it. Yeah, but I just want to get in, in everyone's mind that although he charged with two violations, like you said earlier, he's only one in this complaint. Am Correct. Right? Yes. In other words, this council can only hear the one on which he was charged with. Correct. Yes. That's all I want to know. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. No, I was trying to explain what she what she already did. Thank you. The the other is in process, but the, he can do anything until he finished with this variance first. Any other questions for the petition? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to give public comment on this case? Is there anyone in the audience? Do we have anyone online? Ms. Johnson Velez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Susan Johnson Velez, Legal Department. I just wanted to. Um, Add a couple of points for clarification. I think um, council is clear now that the application before the variance review board was limited to the setback violation for the carport only. Um, so that's number one. Number two is um, there was a statement um, by the applicant's representatives that the carport was built correctly, but if it was built correctly, it would have a permit and it would meet the setbacks. And so um, I would just point that out as well. So I don't I believe it was built correctly. And then finally, um, the applicant's representative also mentioned um, health issues with um, his, you know, the mother and the son. But generally speaking, the, the law of hardship is that things that are personal to a particular property owner cannot justify a hardship. It is supposed to relate to conditions on the land because at some point, this house is going to be sold to another property owner and the variance will remain on the property down to a zero foot setback on the side. Um, with that will remain with the property regardless of new owners coming in that may not have these similar health it, issues. So I just wanted to make sure that um, council was aware of that um, as well. Thank you. Quickly. Of course, we can guarantee that the property will, was is not going to be sold in the future, but everyone knows how the market in Tampa is, and they are. Uh, he works, he's a self-employee doing a lot of uh, small jobs and she works at, at Walmart. So being realistic, they will not be able to afford another home in Tampa. So they will stay there for a long time. It's, it's really what, what I think, so I have to express it. Thank you. And Shelby. Yes, and I, I, I'm uh, sorry, Council, just a reminder then that that is really not relevant how, how long somebody will be able to retain their house. Um, if any council has any questions with regard to um, uh, whether the permits, in, in order to come into pliance, compliance, whether the permits are still required uh, as to the, the issue of drainage. The issue of drainage came up, and the question is whether uh, what it would take for the, um, uh, uh, if the council were to consider this, what it would take for uh, the project to actually have to move forward. Would it then, is there, is there a, a requirement for permits to be issued and to come into compliance with the city code? Susan uh, relative, Johnson, rel Relative to, I'm sorry, just. Re relative to the carport? Relative to the carport. Yes, Susan Johnson, Velez Legal Department. Yes, the, the carport must be in compliance with the, um, with the setback. So they either need to reduce the width of that carport so that it meets by, by seven feet so that it meets the side yard setback um, and, and the building code or, um, you know, or, or get this variance. Now, um, the variance review board, I, I will tell you, um, I, I was in attendance that evening and the board struggled with, you know, the need to have a 13 foot wide carport, especially when you didn't meet the setback. They just didn't feel that there was enough evidence to support the need for the extra width in violation of the setback. They further felt that the drainage issue that you heard described today was solved by directing that water, whatever was constructed to direct the water 
um, out to the street, that that was solved without the need for this additional covered area um, of the carport, which is what in it is in fact violating the setback. Um, so that's, they do need to get that solved before they will be able to um, have complete their permit, permit process. With regard to the construction itself of the carport, would that then be inspected as well? That will be part of the permitting process, That's yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How long her time? So it's 13 feet wide? 13 feet wide by 65 feet long. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. You can tell me if this is not relevant, but the permeable surface then is is part of the issue i believe that is part maybe miss madu can add to that but i believe that was part of the concern as well given the amount of concrete that that also is covering the remainder of the property permission to speak please go right ahead um when this was reviewed by natural resources department this is the comment um according to table 2284.3.3 single family residences are required to have 25% of parcel as green space, and they were not meeting that calculation. Do you know what the percentage was? No, they did not provide the percentage, but just based on an overview of the impervious surfaces that they had, um, it was easy to deduce that they were not meeting that 25%. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff or the petitioner? And I, Ms. Oh, yeah, I believe the petitioners might have the opportunity for rebuttal, but um, I would also like to ask, depending on how the board's or council's discussions go, um, if there, I would like to maybe suggest conditions if you are inclined to, depending on how you would like to proceed. So, thank you. Is thank there you. any rebuttal from the petitioner? Yes. Uh, the reason for the length of the carport is because the gutters, which are on top of the carport, are straightly um, directly uh, on top of the drain. That is why it needs to be the length that it is, so the water can go straight into the drain. Otherwise, it will go just straight into the cement, and it will just stay there since the level is not, since it's, that is on the cement is on level with the, the crawl space in the house. So it will, it will either stay there or go to this side. But the length of the cardboard is there for that reason. So the water can go straight into the drain. That's it. Councilman Miranda. Ma'am, uh, then you're telling me that, or telling us that the cardboard is the length of the house. How, how, does the cardboard match the end of the house? Um, no, no. Well, then what are the water going that's beyond the carport, down at the ground? I'm sorry, I think I misunderstood your question. In other words, if this is the house, uh -huh. does the carport go from here to here, or does the carport end here? Yes. It ends here? Yeah. So what happens when the water is falling here? Where does that go? It's not on the limit of the, like, where the drain, do you, I'll show the picture and I'll explain better. I have the she site plan if you. City Council would like to review the site plan. Yes, can, 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 we, can I see the site plan? Can we see the site plan, mm -hmm. please? The site plan? That's a front site house. Plan. It's site plan. So this is the site plan. This is the home. And this here with the big X is the cop board. So it goes all the way. Yep. And that is the that is the complete carport, not just the concrete pad. Um, is the complete carport with the. 
with the concrete pad. You do have the driveway that is in front, but this part of it is, is, is still paved. And covered? And covered. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for both petitioner and or staff? We have a motion to close by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion passes. What is the pleasure of council? Just, Mr. Chairman, sorry for interrupting, but I just wanted to be clear that after the discussion of seating the site plan, if there was anything that the petitioner needed to add or wanted to add, just for the purposes of the record, just so it's clear. Yes. I think we had rebuttal on that, but we have a motion by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Manscott. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Now, in response, was there any last, any, anything you wanted to add or, or discuss? You don't have to, if, unless you want. There is something. Thank you. Now we're clear for the record. Thank you. A motion to close by Councilman Vera, seconded by Councilman Matt Scott. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. What is the pleasure of Council? Councilman Maniscalco. Before I make a motion, Ms. Johnson, do you have to add anything? You said you were going to suggest something. Yes, sir. If, if uh, it is the council's pleasure to um, overturn the Variance Review Board, I would uh, recommend that a condition be added that the carport area never be enclosed because otherwise somebody could come and put walls up and then you would have a um, you know, solid structure to the zero lot line. So I would just recommend that... Um, you add that condition that that area never be enclosed. Yes, ma'am. That includes by a screen. It would. It could include whatever you would like. If no screen enclosure, no hard surfaces, no air conditioned space. Okay. Yes. Uh, all right. I'll make, I'm, I'm, I'll make a motion. So I make a motion. I move to uh, overturn the VRB's decision hereby approve the variance requested in application number VRB 22-88 for the property located at 1728 West Powhatan Avenue based upon the petitioner presenting competent substantial evidence in the record and at this public hearing of an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty when considering the five hardship criteria set forth in section 27-80 of the city code specifically um, regarding the where the water goes and how it drains, uh, as was explained during the uh, testimony by the applicant or one of the applicant's parties. But I'd also add to like to add that this carport never be enclosed, neither by a screen or by a concrete block or anything, so it can't be made into an extra bedroom or anything like that. It remains a carport as you see it, not an enclosed garage with a door or anything, just an open carport exactly as it is. And those are the stipulations that I would put in this um, in this motion to overturn. We have a motion made by Councilman Mascot, seconded by Councilman Vieira. Any further discussion? Yes, sir. I would like to make a uh, substitute motion. I move to deny, uh, I move to be firm and the VRB decision to deny the variance request of application VRB 2288 for the property located 1728 West Palmton Avenue due to the failure of the petitioner to meet the burden of proof to provide competent substantial evidence in the record at the public hearing for unnecessary hardship and politically practically practical uh, difficulties when considering the five hardships criteria set in section 27-80 city code specifically that and that if you see what's happening here the carport is just not up to the end of the house it goes like well eight or ten feet beyond that so evidently there was something more than just who it was, what it was said here. I don't know what that might be, but then they can have, apply for a license, they can apply for the review, they can get the carport, they can seven feet up at 13, minus seven, bring it to a normal carport that are the size of most of the houses in the city of Tampa, and the length of it's gotta be no more than the length of the house. Uh, Councilman Miranda, I, I, I understand that you wanna be ready and set to go for this, for this. Um, however, we do have a motion that is on the floor and have been seconded. Uh, Councilman Maniscalco made the motion, Councilman Vieira seconded it. 
we have to vote on that before we I can. I don't believe you do. A motion, a secondary, a motion is on the floor and you can ask for a substitute motion and the substitute motion must be voted on first. No, actually. Now there's attorneys here, the attorneys here, the attorneys everywhere. I may be wrong, but I'm, I I'm sorry if I can. My understanding of Robert's Rules of Order is with regard to a substitute motion, actually, frankly, it is um, not a substitute as recognized by Robert's Rules of Order, but rather a motion to amend. And one of the rules of the motion to amend, and I don't have it in front of me, but I certainly can find that I used to have it before the new version, I used to have it marked that a, a motion to amend, here we are. Improper amendments, the following types of amendments are not in order. One that is not germane to the question to be amended, that's number one. Number two, one that merely makes the adoption of the amended question equivalent to a rejection of the original motion. Thus, in a motion that our delegates are instructed to vote in favor of the increase in federation dues, an amendment to insert not or, or B before B is not in order because an affirmative vote on not giving a certain instruction is identical with a negative vote on giving the same instruction. So therefore, uh, a, a, a motion that would be opposite to what is on the floor would be an improper amendment under Robert's Rules of Order, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the maker of the motion can withdraw it if the motion, uh, if the if the maker wishes, or those who w believe that that mo that order, that, excuse me, that motion is not appropriate, can vote to deny it, and then Mr. Miranda's motion would certainly be in order. Councilman Miranda, if if you would do me this, your, your motion is set and ready to go. Let's vote on the first motion first, and then we'll go right into your. We're doing the wrong thing legally, but I, that's what I think, and I have not been proven wrong yet. Then if you would just. Do me, do me this and we'll Then let me, if I ask, Mr. Chairman, please give me a t uh, 10 minutes on this, if we can, and let me resolve this, because I don't or, want to have this in question. Or, I, I or you can withdraw your motion. As a courtesy, withdraw my motion, and we'll take that vote. That will, so does, the, does, does the second uh, allow them to withdraw the motion also? I, I object. I'm joking. That's fine. So you do? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. We now have a motion on the floor by Councilman Miranda. And I get a second. Who oh, knows? I got second. Second. I didn't know. I'm her tap. Any further discussion? No. Roll call vote. Hertat? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goose? Yes. Vieira? No. Menescalco? No. Miranda? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried with Vieira and Menescalco voting no. And now, to be clear for the purposes of the record, if you could announce again what the, um, the result is with regard to a motion to? Motion to deny. And again, the motion to deny passed on a vote of? Five to two with Vieira and Maniscalco voting no. Thank you. Sorry, Susan Johnson, I just want to make sure that it's reflected accurately in the but it's a motion to affirm the VRB decision to deny the application. Oh, right. ah, Correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Could we just, are we clear on that then, Council? Yes. By unanimous yes. consent, that's the way it's to be read? Yes, sir. Thank you. Next agenda item is number 65, file number SU1, 23-04-C. Kamari pettis from the City Attorney's Office. Um, council members, item number 65 is regarding SG1 23-04 for the property located at 801 East Emma Street. This is a petition that was filed by uh, James Jones, Jr. He asked of staff a request um, to use for the use regarding an accessory dwelling unit. Staff re um, reviewed their, the uh, the request from the petitioner and denied the request on January 5th of 2023. And the staff denied the request on the basis that the application did not meet the criteria of code sections 27-132, specifically that an accessory dwelling unit may not be located in a non-conforming accessory structure or structure made conforming, conforming as a result of a variance. Per uh, the staff, the accessory dwelling unit does not meet the required setback per code section 27-211.2.1 for the Seminole Heights District. I have provided city council copies of code sections 
27129, and 27130, along with 27, um, one, and 2761 for the standards of um, standard of review. I've also provided sample motions and the rules of procedure in order to conduct the hearing this afternoon. According to code section 27-61, subsection J, subsection three, city council conducts a de novo standard of re review, which means that um, the review shall not be limited to that information, documentation, or evidence upon which the special use permit was based. City council may accept new information or new evidence. Staff, um, Ms. Laura Marley is present to give the overview of the application and staff's decision. Upon hearing all the evidence in this case, city council can take two actions. City council can affirm the decision of staff and thereby deny the request for the accessory dwelling unit, or city council can overturn staff's decision and thereby grant the request to have the application for the accessory dwelling unit. And if city council has any questions of me, I'm here. If not, um, I would ask for Ms. Marley to give the presentation. Good afternoon, Laura Marley, Development Coordination. Can I please share my screen? Yes. Ms. Marley, you, get, you need to be sworn in, please. I swore I swore in with the VRB case, but if you'd like me to do it again, I will. We, so that, we, if, if we will we will take your uh, your word. Well, actually, if we can, I don't believe she was on screen. Was she? At the, she was on screen. Okay, good. And Mr. Chairman, I'm very sorry, but just a, vo uh, a motion to ex accept the ex parte communications, if there are so any, moved. into the record. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Was it sworn in? No. Oh. This gentleman over here. Have you not been sworn in? No. Council, do you see my PowerPoint? Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is a petition for appeal for SU 12304. The petitioner and property owner is James Earl Jones, Jr. The property address is 801 East Emma Street. The zoning is Seminole Heights Single Family Detached Residential, SHRS. The special use request is for an accessory dwelling unit. This is an aerial of the property and it is outlined in red. This is the site plan that the applicant submitted. This is the survey that the applicant submitted, and this is the existing accessory. Um, as you can see, the setbacks here are 3.9, here's 2.2, and here is two. The code requirements are a, it needs to be a maximum of 950 square feet of living space. B, it's only approved when the main residence is owner occupied. C, is it may be occupied in a conforming structure and it may not be occupied in a non-conforming accessory structure. D, no time the number of occupants may be more than two and E, the special use permit will be reviewed annually by staff. The reason for denial is a proposed accessory structure. Um, it would be existing and it doesn't meet the minimum um, required setbacks as required by code, so it's considered non-conforming. A street side setback of three feet is required. The existing accessory structure does not comply with the side street setback requirement and requested a two foot setback for the side street setback and going back to the um, site plan the applicant is also asking to waive parking requirements and you cannot waive parking requirements with a special use application and that is the end of my presentation
Commissioner. Yeah, first time here, so very, very nervous, obviously. Um, Take your time. <laughs> Take your time. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. What? Yeah, as I stated, uh, my name is James Earl Jones, Jr. I live at 801 East Emma Street um, in Sonal Heights. I bought the house in 2011, and it was set up as a rental property exclusively, uh, two in the house and two in the garage. The house is now currently my home, no rentals, of course, and uh, and I had to turn, I had to tear apart both of the rentals in the garage as per the agreement of buying the house because I didn't ask for any kind of rental when I bought it. But the plan was to possibly do rental in the future, which is where we're at now. The bottom floor is currently a garage only for that purpose. I'm trying to get the t upstairs floor set up as an apartment. Um, the zoning office said I couldn't do my uh, special use one because a few things you guys need to approve here versus their office. Um, the first one was the parking. Um, what I'm requesting is a variance for the, the distance needed. There's currently, uh, the rules are 16 by 18, and what I have is 19 by 18, but my property line stops at nine foot, and the additional nine foot six is city property, thus the need for a variance to use that as my parking. Because um, you'll see what I have, this is where my car is at here. That's the, the front of the garage right there. Can you so, out for us, please? Oh. Hmm? sorry. No, they didn't. Thank you. <laughs> and I have examples of um, different garages around the, the city of Seminole Heights that already use the same kind of concept. You see, most of them extend into the, the city property. I'm assuming are authorized at some point in time. And uh, you guys are very familiar with you know, Seminole Heights and Hyde Park as far as the same type of garage apartments. Um, and we have, uh, so that's that first thing there. The second one I heard about was, which I still, am, I guess, kind of missing, the street side boundary setback. Um, the requirement is three foot on all sides, and I'm not sure what they saw in the blueprint that shows two feet, but you can see on the original picture I put on there, sorry, that the, the fence line is, is pretty much where my property is, a couple foot in front of it, and there's much more than two feet off the street. And I'm not sure if the, what the two feet is supposed to be on the, on the blueprint, but that was the side I was told was the issue. And there's actually, uh, I think I had the overhang alone on the garage is 13 feet off the street. And then the actual, the wall underneath is 18 feet. So there's plenty of room. So I guess I'm not really sure what the two foot means in the blueprints. And I was unable to find any kind of answer for that um, as far as that goes. And the last was the height of the building. Again, not sure what that was. I think it's the today's current standards require something. And the building itself is 15 foot 6 inches to the actual wall height. And the roof height was 20 foot. And I think I submitted 20 foot originally. And without any kind of questions, they assumed the whole building the whole building's on 20 foot tall. You know, and all this is kind of based off of a, no one came out and saw the garage or measured anything themselves. And they basically kind of declined me for the original part without getting more into the other sections of it as well. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's pretty much it as far as the three things that I was understanding were the, the issues they had with denying me. Yeah, and that's it for mine. Thank you. Councilman Hurtak. Um, th this does not look like a new accessory structure. How oh, no. old? How uh, old? Built in nineteen twenties. The house itself was nineteen thirteen. The garage is built in the nineteen twenties. And yeah. if I'm correct from the visual we had, your next door neighbor or you're on Talia Faro. The garage, the, the, the garage faces Talia Faro, and Would, my house faces Emma. Yes, but then next to Talia Faro is the interstate. Yes, okay. on the last so house on the end. So you don't have anyone across from you. No. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the petitioner? Send in your presentation, sir. Yes. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak to this case? Anyone in chambers? Do we have anyone online? 
Um, Kamaria Pettis, Malcolm from the League of Apartment. If I could just please have Ms. Um, Marley explain the um, staff's decision regarding the two-foot setback and how it was denied based upon the two-foot setback. And, and, and again, verify, confirm about the parking information. If I could share my screen again, please. Okay. Um, can you see the survey on the screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Here's the um, accessory structure, and here is the two foot from the property line. Um, if you can see, I, I believe this is where the fence is existing. It's outside of the property line. It's in the right of way. Um, so this part may be grass, and this is the right of way here. Um, so this portion from the accessory structure to the property line is two feet. The corner is 2.2 feet, and on this side it's 3.7, on this side it's 3.9, so they're meeting it on this side, just not on this side. And um, the memo that we received um, from transportation, there is two parking spaces required, um, and there's not two parking spaces on this site, and so it cannot be waived with a special use application. Any further questions for staff? Motion to close. He, he's entitled to a rebuttal. I, thank you. Well, Do you have a rebuttal, sir? He was telling me, because I know, like I said, the, the two foot, my the garage, so if you, again, you can see it. It's farther back than two foot my property line. But he was telling me, I guess I have to have a, a new paper saying that part. Because like I said, the two foot that I see is on the other side of the, the line. It's not showing two foot from the garage property line, that's actually a nine foot span of space. But I, you know, it, it's not showing on here. Did you want to put that on the overhead and point that out to council oh, what you're referring well, to? Well, I, I drew, that's the same blueprint she should have for you. I drew an outline of the property here. That's the measurements that I made. Like I said, you see the, the front wall here is five foot behind the overhang. And from the wall to my property line is actually nine feet. It's just not, like I said, I don't know why that's not included on here, and I have no idea what that two foot, the two foots in front of the property line, I guess the fence space, but they don't actually have anything written on here. What are you referring to, sir? If you could put that on the overhead, what oh, you're referring that's to. that's a different you guys had, sorry. Because um, I was pointing to, where is it? They have, oh, sorry. Yeah, you'll see, like I said, you know, again, the the very front wall of the garage is right here. And it shows a five foot five overhang. So the very minimum, the, the wall on the ground, the first floor is five foot five away from the front of the property. But overall, it's additional four foot pass out. Like I said, it's nine foot total to my property marker. Because like I said, second, second floor has a five foot five space. It's obviously that the door for the first floor is behind that, the five foot five feet. So it has to be the bottom floor is over two foot away from the property setback. Because yeah, just a drawing alone you know, where the property is supposed to be, and then the overhead is behind that, and then five foot five is measured there. So it must be more than two foot. I still am not sure what the two foot on that side of the fence means for. So just to clarify, so this, so these are the points of the property. Well, they're not up there. The points of the property are the, you know, here and here. 
Yeah. So that's the property line. So under under Eric Cotton, City of Tampa Zoning Office, under the under Chapter Twenty Seven, anything above three feet in height has to meet setbacks. So the setback has to be three feet from that point to the closest portion that's above thirty six inches. That's that measurement that's being reflected on here. That's the basis for the denial from staff. Is the required setback is three feet because it's in it's a non-conforming structure. The distance from that property line back to the closest portion is two feet. That's what that says right there. You can read it. That says two feet. That's the basis for our denial from staff. Had had it been at three feet, it would have been approvable outside of other issues that he has to address when he goes through permitting. So the basis for the reason why he's in front of council today is structure is non-conforming. The only way to make it, the only way to get an approval is through going before city council on the petition for review. Councilman Hertak. Mr. Cotton. Yes, ma'am. And again, from my understanding, this was built in 1920. So therefore, this was before setback rules. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. We have a motion to close by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much. We were hoping that you were the other James Earl Jones. <laughs> but I'm, I'm an oh, asset so funny. much. Yeah. I looked at him, he looked at me, Darth Vader. My, my, my whole life, yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, and this will not have any basis or effect on my decision. <laughs> and actually, Tuesday was Star Wars night at the arena where I work. I kept hearing it all night long. I'm like, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'd like to make a motion to overturn the zoning administrator's denial of special use one application, Second. SU 1-23-04, for the property located at 801 East Emma Street, because the petitioner has demonstrated that the specific standards set forth in Tampa City Code Section 27-132 and the general standards set forth in 27-129 should be weighed for the following reasons. Um, Council Member Hertag just brought up what I was going to ask, uh, and what I'll include here, is that this structure is over 100 years old or 100 years old, and it yeah. predates a lot of the current rules and regulations that we have. Therefore, I think that alone, on top of other things that were mentioned, um, would uh, deserve the basis to overturn the denial and therefore approve uh, your request. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertet? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> now, we have staff here. Let's go back to agenda item number five, file number F23-79622. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Council, Mike Perry, Revenue and Finance. Uh, before you, is staff is asking you to approve a grant agreement with the state of Florida to accept reimbursement funds for Hurricane Ian when they become available. We've already given city council six periodical updates. We spent approximately $10.5 million thus far. The staff report provides additional information. More than likely, we will receive the funding from FEMA over the next two fiscal years. In the meantime, funding has been provided via previous city council appropriations for emergency reserves and future funding agreement um, and everything on track. And this is the next step for our um, Hurricane Ian reimbursement. That's all I have, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the chairman stepped out real quick. I, um, as you mentioned already, this has been presented in front of council various times by Mr. O'Hara in regards to how the funding is, how it's spent, and how we are reimbursed. Um, so I think this is just a formality. Any questions from council members? No, we have a motion from council member Goods and a second from council member Vieira to move this resolution. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much.
Thank you. Have a good evening. Good you day. as well. Item number six, uh, we have Mr. Washington. Mr. Washington. Is Mr. Washington on the line? Yes, sir. Can you see me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, wonderful. So I have item number six, as you mentioned. I'm Larry Washington, Director of Solid Waste and Environmental Program Management Department. And I'm here to discuss item number six, which is a motion that was made by Councilman Hertek to address the holiday pickups. A memo was provided, and I'm here to answer any question that the council has. Do we have any questions? This motion was made by Councilwoman Hertek. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have read the report, and I just, I just fundamentally disagree with it. Um, uh, I believe it says there are no inconsistencies, and when you have a group of people who miss three pickups on one day four times a year, that is inconsistent. Um, so there, uh, folks who have a Monday pickup miss not only their garbage, but their recycling and their yard trash four times a year. Last year, it was six times a year. Um, so I, I, we can agree to disagree on this, but what I, would, I wanted to do, uh, what, what I asked Mr. Washington to do during my pre-meeting and would like him to do, uh, I can make a motion, is for uh, him to come back to us with what other cities are doing about this. This is the only place um, I've ever lived that's had this issue. Um, and I continue to get it from um, constituents. So I would, uh, I would ask that uh, Mr. Washington come back to us. Uh, what, what kind of time frame do you need? Well, ma'am, before we move forward, can I offer some additional information as well? Please if, go right ahead. Come on. Yes, sir. So this is some awesome research after speaking to Councilman Hertek as well. So Hillsborough County, they do the same thing as that, the same exact thing that we do as far as provide um, our holiday collection in the manner that we do. So it's on their website as well. It's it mirrors each other. Um, St. Pete, St. Pete, indeed, they provide the day after service. And if you would like, I can share my screen so you can see the service boundaries and whatnot. Wonderful. All right. Let me know when it shows. Yep. It's there. Okay, so do you see the residential service schedule? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's call it the, the Great Divider. So the Great Divider for us is Columbus Drive. So north of Columbus Drive, that's our Monday, Thursday service, and south of Columbus Drive, that is our Tuesday and Friday service. And that is in regards to, of course, garbage collection. And going back to St. Pete, so yes, they have two days of collection for garbage. However, they do not have yard waste collection. They have drop-off centers. In addition, they have bi-weekly, they have bi-weekly recycling service. Here in the city of Tampa, we have weekly recycling service and weekly yard waste. So that's the, one of the differences between us and them and our population. We, we are, I believe, uh, over 120,000 over their population. I think they're, let's see, I have my slide right here. Okay, so. We're upwards of 400,000, they're upwards to 300,000 as far as the population for their cities in comparison to ours. So um, I know that uh, a study that was re requested, but we did some other research as well. And this was brought forth back in 2009, moved forward by council in 2010 by the previous administration, and then addressed again by council, or uh, let's see, Mr. Mr. Wilfog, my predecessor, back in 2014 with the memo that was provided by him to council and it was accepted as well. So in the memo that I provided, I addressed the cost associated with providing that day after service or like cities like um, Orlando and Miami and Clearwater, they provide service on the actual holidays. And here in the city of Tampa, as you know, we value our, our employees and we really wanna put a focus on work-life balance as well. So we want to make sure that our employees have those days off and the union, in addition, they, they, uh, they, they champion this, this deployment. So they, I spoke to uh, Mr. Steve Simon, excuse me, spoke to Mr. Steve Simon and he read the memo as well and he approved of the memo because it gives our, our customers the ability to not have increased rates because if we do go and forward and move, with, move forward with a, a change in our schedules, then that cost will incur, and it's upwards of 
And unfortunately, we'll have to pass it off to the public. So I do want to bring those points forward. In addition, lastly, if we were to change the schedule, we would decrease our work-life balance and increase emissions, increase traffic congestions, increase OT overtime, increase noise pollution, and lastly, increase vehicle and equipment expenses. So I just want to make sure that you all know that as well before we move forward with making an additional motion. Um, thank you for that. Then maybe we need to then talk about um, a cost reduction for those folks who are missing services. Um, I think that's probably fair. Um, given if we could find, if you could let us know, um, I would love mm -hmm. for you to come back uh, with what that costs a customer for a day to get their garbage and recycling and yard trash picked up. Because I feel pretty strongly, I mean, it's fine if it's a Thursday, a Friday, but those people on Monday every mm -hmm. year get at least three days. So they really shouldn't have to pay what everybody else pays because they're not getting the same level of service. And, and that's fine. I, I, I appreciate the balance, um, the work-life balance. So I think that's another way we can go about it is to simply reduce their garbage rate. Understood. And I would like to add one more thing. So whenever we do move forward with a with a holiday and then let's say that we provide service the following <laughs> service day. So for example, on Monday we have Dr. Martin King Jr. Day. We provide service on that following Thursday. So as far as garbage that is collected, the same volume is collected. No one outsources a potential vendor to come and collect it and then take it to a disposal facility, we still provide the same value of collection. So garbage, recycling, and yard waste, whether it's the following service day or the service day after that, we still collect it. But I'm sure that we can still provide that, that study. Um, if you give me, let's say, if you don't mind giving me six months to make sure that I can get everything done, use these studies. And I'll make sure it's very detailed as well. We'll cover what you initially asked for and um, what you just currently asked for as well. And we'll have a really robust study that covers everything from top to bottom. And we'll have to outsource it, unfortunately. I, I, I don't six, think- six months will give you I, enough time. I, I have, I'm not really interested in an outsourced study. I just want to okay. know how much it costs to do that basic stuff. Because I will argue okay. that somebody who has to hold yard waste onto yard waste for an extra week is inconvenienced. So, um, what I will do, uh, I, I'm just going to request that you come back and let us know, mm -hmm. you know again, just the cost of a of garbage and recycling and a yard trash pickup. I don't know if it's the same cost for each, but basically what you pay. I mean, can't you just divide that by? Thank you. The unit cost. I would love the unit cost. Okay, I can do that. Thank you so much. Um, can you do that uh, within a month? Just give me two, ma'am. If you don't mind. Oh, two months? Sure. No problem. Yeah. Okay, great. Quickly, that Council, relative two. to the rates, Morris Massey Legal Department, I do want to just caution you all to the extent that we are, have borrowed or are borrowing money for the salt waste system, that the rates back that up, and so we have to factor that in. So it may be a little more complicated than, than Council would like. So I just need to caution you all that. So. I appreciate that, but I, I, people don't seem to understand what I'm trying to say, yeah. uh, that people are not getting the same level of service. And again, I hear this over and over again Understood. from constituents, um, that they're paying the same rate and are, are not getting the same number of pickups. I understand what you're saying, uh, uh, Councilman, uh, Council Member Pertak. I just want to make sure you all are aware that there could be a fiscal impact that needs to be examined as well. That may um, be. And, so. and, I, and I think that's okay, but I don't think we all should be paying the same rate if we're not getting the same level of service. So May 4th is great. Um, I would like you to come back with this uh, for with unit costs on May 4th. Jim? All right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any, any, any second? Are, 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 you yes, with, are you finished yes. with your? Yes, that's my motion. Are, are, you, are you finished talking, though? Can I recognize Councilman Goods? Yes. Thank you. Councilman Goods. Good afternoon, Mr. Washington. Yes, sir. I me and you have had this conversation several times. We have, Several sir. times. And I guess, I, I, I guess uh, other people have gotten other uh, Councilwomen's ear about the same thing. 
And I, I, I talked about this thing for so I don't know how long about this, 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 I want to say miscollections, but the skipping of the days. Uh, and, you know, and your own uh, employees have talked about it because they're concerned, you know, that the residents aren't getting uh, equal balance. This is from your own employees. Now, I know it comes down to a cost factor. I think it's overtime. I think when Mark was here, you know, uh, I, think, I think it came down to overtime issues and some other stuff, but the councilwoman is right in, in her point. Now, it's, it's a way we're going to have to try to balance this thing because she is right when you're talking about equitable distribution to all of our citizens uh, to get their, their trash picked up, uh, especially when we talk about our holidays and we talk about uh, the missed days. Uh, and again, I know uh, trash collection is very important to people. <laughs> You know, people don't think that, but it is very yes. important to people, you know. So I, 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 would, I would ask, you know, uh, I'm going to go along with her motion, of course, but I, I want to make sure that we can find that balance. Again, when your own employees uh, have, 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 have uh, talked to council people about this and, and constituents, I think we need to kind of reevaluate what probably was the past doing a, a, a lot more with less, I guess you could say, because I think that's why, mm -hmm. I, get that, I guess that's why it turned to where it's, it's turned the way we're at this point. So I think we need yes, to kind of look at how we can kind of peel it back now and see how we can level it out now uh, and so that people can understand how their, their dollars are being spent for them, their, their communities. Yes, sir, and I would like to add that I took a poll two years prior to, um, to see how our our internal team felt, our residential team felt about the holidays and what they wanted to do so I can potentially bring up to the administration. And most of them were in favor of, have, have, of having those days off versus going after the, you know, the overtime and working on those days. It was more, I want to spend time with my family, going back towards that work-life balance. So I definitely understand, but we will make sure that we get that study to you. And, and it probably won't all, but the same token, if you have to look at the flip side. Yeah, the employee might want to off because of the holiday. I get that. But by the same token, we're gonna we're missing some days, couple of days between that. The residents are saying that they're like, well, I'm paying for a service that I'm not getting. So I I, I get that too. So uh, again, we I guess we just gotta kind of figure it out, see what we can do, but not what we can't do. I understand, sir. And I do want to mention that it is equitable. I know that was mentioned in the uh, the initial request to discuss as far as the north end of the city versus the south end of the city with the Great Divider being Columbus, it is equitable on both sides. Those holidays do flip some, from time to time as Councilman Hertag mentioned, and we still, we still provide the same exact service going above and beyond to collect everything that's out there. I get that, but the east side services. is saying they're always missed on the holidays though. I get what you're saying, I hear you. Yes, sir. I, but that All ain't right. what's happening though, I hear you. But the east side mm -hmm. is getting missed, and you, so that, that's not totally accurate. But I know you're trying to go where the equitable balance is kind of filtering in, but it's not totally the way it's happening, though. All due respect, sir. I appreciate you, though, because you always help me out when I need you. Oh, okay. anytime, sir. <clears throat> Councilman Goods, are you finished? Yes, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just thinking of individuals like myself who don't need any garbage pickup but once every three months because I live alone. I go do for them. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. That's all. <laughs> Thank no, you, I'm not talking we to, actually I, have I a program for a smaller garbage can. I'm not trying can. to cut the revenue. I'm just saying, what are you going to do for them? <laughs> There's a lot of us. They have a reduced program for folks who have just... No, you get, a, you get a $5 discount at the end of the month. You really do for seniors. All seniors are entitled to that over 65 years of age. I didn't know. Yeah, there's a. But well, uh, right now I'm saving you guys money. Anybody yeah. over sixty-five dollars a month is entitled to five dollars. Am I right, Mr. Washington? Yes, sir. We do go above and beyond for um, there the certain <laughs> citizens or residents in our city as well. So, if you are if you're challenged in a way, then we provide backdoor service. If you are five and over, then of course you receive the service that Ms. Brander is mentioning. So, yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Washington. We have a motion on the floor made by Councilwoman Hertak, seconded by Councilman Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Councilwoman Hertak, does that satisfy this yes. side of the report? Thank you. Yes, very thank much. you so much. Agenda item number seven, file number E2023 H27. Good afternoon, Council. Waiting for my presentation to come up. This is 
a presentation related to land development code text amendments. <coughs> So as, as Council is aware, uh, we are now uh, only accepting publicly initiated text amendments. Uh, those are originating from either City Council or from the Zoning Administrator. Text amendments are processed in two cycles, January and July, and so this presentation is focused on the January 2023 amendment cycle. Uh, in this cycle, there are eight amendments that are proposed by the Zoning Administrator and one amendment that was requested by City Council. We've made some adjustments to the schedule going forward and some of the public engagement opportunities to reflect uh, some requests that were made uh, from citizens last cycle. So currently we uh, are here to go over the conceptual amendments with you and get your, uh, your concurrence um, to move forward into public engagement. We're proposing three public engagement meetings for these nine amendments. Those would be tentatively on March 20th, March 21st, and March 22nd in the evening. Uh, after those meetings, we would then uh, open up a formal public comment period uh, by posting the, the information in the language online. And uh, in April, we would then take the comments that we received and transmit final language back to, uh, back to council uh, and be available to present the final language at the workshop in April, on April 27th. Uh, the amendments that council decides to move forward would then be transmitted to the Planning Commission and uh, then they would go forward to the Planning Commission briefing, Planning Commission public hearing, and then first and second reading. Uh, this is just a list of the nine amendments as well as the originator. Uh, your packet has the name of each person that originated the amendment as well as their contact information. So if there are questions from the public, they can reach out directly to that person if they would like. And now we will uh, go uh, through each of the amendments in concept, and I'm gonna ask uh, Eric Cotton to present the first six amendments to you. Oh, I took it off the screen so I get a look at it. Yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen, didn't the mayor say to vote against the amendments? Pardon? Didn't the mayor say to vote against the amendments? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> good, good afternoon, Council. Eric Cotton, Development Coordination. The first one before you is an amendment to chapter to section 27149, which is the public notice requirements. In the event, staff is proposing in the event of an emergency such as Hurricane Ian, if you recall, City Council had to convene that night to cancel, to postpone the hearing. They had to open up the hearing to postpone it. This would create language in the code that would allow an automatic continuance of those cases without having for Council to convene. They would just move it automatically to the, to the next available hearing. And then at that point, Council could then either schedule the hearings for another time or meet without having to have the people re-notice all their, their process and such. Um, the next one, do I control this or do I control it? Ah, there we go. Um, the next request, believe it or not, on our signs and on our notice letters, it does. there is a space where you put in the application number. It is actually not required by code. And we have had applicants in the past say, well, you can't say on this notice because it's not required by the code. This would actually just to clean up to require the record number be placed on both the sign and the notice letter that's mailed to the participating organizations and the um, neighbors within 250 feet. Um, this is a minor one. In a sense, in Seminole Heights, the code actually says 55 stories for the maximum height, not 55 feet. So this is just an amendment to actually just clarify that it's actually only 55 feet. For um, 27290.1, fence regulations, when you're a single family home and you are you share a property line with a commercial business, the maximum you can put your fence up is six feet. The commercial business can go up to eight feet by right. Previously, it was a variance somebody had to apply for to go up to the taller height. Um, now it's a design exception one. This would just amend the code to say, if I'm a residential next to a commercial, I can have that eight foot that the commercial would be allowed to have. Adaptive reuse is allowed in the Ybor City Districts. Adaptive reuse in general is the ability, if you have a historic building or a contributing structure in a historic district that can be on the, um, the landmark list, like the like Ybor, like cigars or older buildings from the 1920s that are, somebody wants to propose a different use in, in a zone commercial, 
that you can do that use without having to go through the complete permitting process to require parking or to go through and either ask for a variance or ask for a design exception or ask for a rezoning. It allows you to do an adaptive reuse to change that use of that building, a historic building without having to go through other processes that the city has. Again, it's allowed right now in Ebor. I actually received an email from a lady this morning who wants to do one in East Tampa. She wants to do an adaptive reuse, but she can't because it's not allowed in East Tampa. It actually would still be limited just to historic districts, so her email, I'll talk to her tomorrow, just to not get off topic. Um, the next one we have is a courtyard. So council is familiar with these from, from different appeal hearings. Um, in 27282, there's specified, the specified uses talks about semi-detached homes and um, some attached townhome style homes that they have to have, they have to face the public street. If they can't, they can get an administrative approval from the design, from the zoning administrator to do a courtyard concept. So we don't define what a courtyard is in the code. Over the years, it's morphed into different things. Um, there are some, this is one that was previously approved for semi-detached. Um, garages are faced forward, but you can see on the site plan, they created a walkway, they created a courtyard for each individual property owner that they had and their entrances are on the side so they could meet, they attempt to get the density and the parking required for the two single family attached, semi-detached um, homes. Um, this is an example of other types of courtyards. This is something that it was approved through a PD by city council. Again, it shows each individual unit has their own private area that they utilize that they call their own. So it differentiates between the public realm in a sense and the private property. Um, this is a site plan. This is also from a plan development. This is at Corona Roland and Sterling. Again, um, you can see the courtyards on the back side of the property. The, the front ones have doors facing the street, so they're okay. On the back side, they did the you know, solid main main drive through with the with the garages on the um, rear loading, and they did the courtyard concept for the ones that don't face the street. And this is at um, Tampania in Cleveland. This is also this was also done through a plan development, but you can see how the structures are oriented. The first set is oriented towards Cleveland. The end ones are oriented towards Tampania, but all the rest of them are oriented towards a courtyard concept where um, you know, that's the entrances to the garage. You can see the two units on the end facing the street. And then you can see the other units on the inside facing a courtyard concept. Um, solid waste, this is a proposal from Solid Waste. They're proposing changes to um, 27288. And that's more for the design standards for um, both dumpster enclosures and cart enclosures to make them a little bit larger than they are right now. More for the equipment that's being used to pick them up and to call it so they don't have any issues with the, with the trucks and such. Um, the West Shore Overlay District, um, somebody from West Shore, this was actually initiated in a sense by West Shore. They reached out to city staff to make some changes to the overlay district. If you recall, the original West Shore Overlay District was implemented by the West Shore Alliance. They were very had their hands in trying to create what was best for West Shore. The amendments that they're proposing are again, they're initiated. West Shore Alliance has reached out to staff. They were here this morning, but he's not here this afternoon. So those are what those requests are for. And um, the next one is the alternative design criteria. This was initiated by city council. This we discussed last Thursday night. This would implement um, changes to the code to require notice for all special use, for all design exceptions. The amendment that went forward last Thursday that's gonna have second reading on March 16th is for strictly for setback requests, requiring notice for those. If, if so just so council knows, in the past two years, we've processed over 600 design exceptions that have come before you, it would be possible that you could have even 10% of those 60, 60 appeals that could go before city council. Um, staff is working on two things that will probably go in the next cycle, which would be 
a change to 2760 that did the criteria for approval, and also 2761, if you recall, I think um, Councilwoman Hertek made a motion, I don't know, two months ago or so, three months ago, about the appeals process, how it should work out. We're investigating that too. That'll be the next cycle. But just if, you know, staff would recommend um, on this one, limiting what would be, what you want notice for to criteria that would not, we process a lot of stuff as design exceptions because that's the process that the city has set up for the Acela system. But some of these are for reductions in parking. By code, you have a right to request a reduction up to 50% of your parking through um, if the structure was built prior to 1986. You can do shared parking. I can do parking off this off. I can borrow parking from a neighbor if they're over parked. So all those would have a possibility of going before council. You know, so pleasure of council what they would like to move forward with that. And the last, the last one which we did not ask, we, not in Stephen's memo, but Abby and I talked about this yesterday. If council would give me a little leeway on this, let me change this to the. Nope, it's done. Oh, it is on. Um, this came forward probably. Um, this was um, Councilman Citro, Chair of Mr. Chair Citro's request for EV language and requiring EV. And this would amend the code under the parking um, requirements to require people to be EV capable. EV capable just means the infrastructure is in place that when people are ready or when development's ready, they could go ahead and go ahead and put in the chargers up front when they're doing the construction, not trying to retrofit something. Let me take that off of here and go back to well, wrong thing. I'll let them control it in the back because obviously I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. There it is. Um, Council, have any questions? Yes. Council, one that. Can you go back to six? Six. Which one is six? That one. Carport. Oh, uh, courtyards. Yeah, go back another slide or two. Yeah, that's a good one. I understand what you all are trying to do, but these are awful. They're just awful. They don't encourage interaction with the street. They create their own neighborhoods instead of what they're supposed to do, which is encourage. I mean, those that are sort of facing the front really aren't facing the front. That's, that's not an inviting, engaging uh, entrance. So instead of trying to connect this definition of a courtyard, I'd really rather us work on ways to actually make them a part of the community, to fit the community around them, because they really don't. They stick out like a sore thumb. I can't talk about these when they come in front of us. I can't share this opinion, but now's the perfect time to talk about it, because that is not, what that looks like to me is an apartment complex. It looks like it's. Yeah, a suburban apartment complex. And that is not what we need in our urban environment. It, it just simply isn't. And so I don't support the courtyard definition, and I absolutely don't support these. And any way we can stop them, I'm about. So I, I don't know what your suggestions are here, but the definition of a courtyard is simply not going to help. And, and honestly, anything that makes these come in front of us to decide on until we get a better code for this, I'm all for. Yes, ma'am. Councilman Carlos. I, I met with the Bloomberg people a couple days ago. I assume, or is everybody else meeting with them? I and and uh, Stephen King for part of it. And um, I think we have, I think we have to look at this whole thing strategically and from the right, the correct end of it. Um, and and I don't want to repeat what happened the other day. I appreciate all the hard work everybody's doing, but it seems like we've got things moving in different ways, but it, it, I don't see what the big picture is and how it's all tied in. And one of the questions that Bloomberg people asked me was, um, well, let me back up. It, it appears that this is coming from a, a, a very good analysis of the exceptions, and I think you all are trying to figure out how can we save everybody's time by not having certain things come before council. My preference is to eventually get to a hearing master or something, so city council, City Council, should, I think, should be spending uh, like 80, 70, 80 percent on policy and 20 percent on real estate. It's the other way around right now. Um, 
but um, and, and you know, similar to the county, we should be working on policy. Um, but um, what I said to the Bloomberg people, the, one of the first questions they asked us is, "Do you think we need to modernize the code?" And I said, "What do you mean by that? Is there like a UCC for code?" And they said, "No." And I said, "Well, it, if there's no standard." Uh, that other cities use that if, if we're trying to make it simple for developers and everyone to understand then then it's not modernizing it it is then it is thinking about what the land use is that goes with it and 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 then the question is well what do you think we should change in the in the uh, comprehensive plan and the zoning code and I said we don't know that because we don't know what the plan is yet and every city that I've been in uh, you know I, I spend a lot of time in Asia I travel to Asia all the time I travel to, to Middle East where these cities have come out of deserts and, and, and islands, and they, they built huge cities with, with millions of people in them from nothing in the last, in the last 10 or 20 years. And, um, it, but they start with, um, it, some of them more than others, uh, getting public input on what the public wants, and then they do 3D models of it. Like Shanghai literally had a room this big that had a big 3D plastic model in it for a long time. Now. They're doing it digitally. If you all have been over to the SPP, you've seen that uh, with the projection mapping and everything on it. I, you know, we had a, like two or three years ago, somebody in South of Gandhi said, why is it that you all are going to convert this park next to me into, into um, apartments? How dare you do that? My kid's been playing in, on this park for two years. And the, and the owner said, well, you guys have been trespassing because it's always been private property. I mean, how is it that the public doesn't know what things are going to look like? And so my point is that we're looking at every, I think the, 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 although this analysis is great and I appreciate it, th there has to be a strategy and a vision that goes into all of this. And there was quite a bit of work on downtown done in the last 10 or 15 years. And some of it I think was really good. Um, but we didn't really look at the neighborhoods. And neighborhoods have to be developed around neighborhood commercial districts. Um, and, and they have to be planned around people. We have to plan around people and then Steve and I had a long discussion about this. So that we have to plan around people. Once we plan around how people and businesses are going to interact with space, then we look at the code and we look at the comprehensive plan and change it there. But it seems like we're going from the opposite end. My, I pre, I very much appreciate all this work because we need to save time, everybody's time. I wish that we could start with a real vision and a real plan for land use, and then adapt the code and the and the comprehensive plan to match that. Thank you. Council on her time. I know count, I, I know staff hates these as much as we do. I mean, to some degree. They're not what we're trying to do. So we and, and quite frankly, our city was built to be a suburban city, just design wise. And so we're trying to catch up with a city that's no longer really a suburban city. And I don't know if the definition of a courtyard really matters, but I just want to see less of this in whatever way possible. Abby Field, thank you. Abby Philly, Deputy Administrator of Development and Growth Management. I just want to ask, is this, this is, the courtyard, if, can you put that slide back up for a minute, please? So, a um, couple things. The code speaks to being, the code requires that entrances face a street, okay? I actually processed this PD. When the discussion came up amongst our team to provide you with some pictures, I said, go to this one, because I actually saw it constructed, and it wasn't half as bad as what it was on the site plan. You have a street um, on this slide, if you're looking at it like I am, to the right, you have Cleveland, right? And to the bottom, you have Tampania. If everything had to face a street, this project would have ended up with substantially less units. When you balance that with the housing crisis we are in, we have to look for alternatives to be able to maximize the small lots that we have. I can actually go back and show you near Mitchell Elementary some older product to this that has complete blank walls that would have faced Tampania, and at that time, it would have met the code. So there have been iterations of this code that have improved the quality of the product that we have been able to provide. 
and it is a balance. At this time, the code speaks to allowing an applicant to request an alternative such as a courtyard. There is no definition. Staff is trying to put one in to provide some parameters to what that would in fact include if it is acceptable. Right now, somebody can put in a strip and claim it's a courtyard, and because there's no definition, technically, we could either approve it or deny it. And given some of the other things that we have heard in relation to certainty, staff providing things that, or administrative determinations that have a foundation in the code, um, we are looking to do that. If that is not the desire, that's fine. We will not do that. That will not take out the fact that courtyard and that alternative remains in the code as an option for people who are applying for these. So right now, they do come to you. It's not going to stop the pipeline. I have not seen an application. I, I, I believe there's been one recently on Cyprus that was denied. But amongst the majority of them, when they come and ask for the waiver not to face a right of way, which is the picture we're showing you, it is being approved. So I understand the longer term. I actually had my own session with Bloomberg yesterday afternoon to say how I would rewrite the code and what I would do, given that for close to 23 years now, I've lived it, breathed it, eaten it, and spent many late nights here till 3 o'clock in the morning trying to get properties rezoned. And I wish we didn't have to do that. So that, that's some background to that. I understand that picture's not preferable to you, or, or I don't necessarily know to the other members what's up there, but I think what is being proposed is to provide some additional consistency and reliability within the code that is currently not present. What would that, what would that definition look like? Like what, what the first we, step today is do? to get you to agree that we should go and pursue it. And then, so today is the concept. Today we're saying to you, the code doesn't currently define courtyard. In this next set of text amendments, we would like to do that. And then Eric and, and Stephen will start working on what those courtyard definitions and the exact language are. And you'll still have the option then at that time to say, yay, nay. It's, it's just like we did it with the ADUs. What do you think an ADU should have? OK, and then we came back with that language. Unfortunately, it didn't go anywhere. I mean, the man today, if we had passed that, that nonconforming structure would have been permitted. He wouldn't have had to appeal to you. Um, so we don't have that exact language for you today. That would be what we would start to prepare. OK, thank you. So I do just, um, uh, if you could bring up the. Along those lines, then, if we go to number nine. So if this is just conceptual, then my request for this would be simply to take this to the public with all the list of things that could be noticed and see what the public has an interest in. I think we could whittle it down that way pretty nicely, or at least start. Um, I think uh, I agree some of this seems, you know, fence height, some of this stuff, but what are some of the things that the public is most concerned about? So if they had a list of that, that might be a, um, I think that's a perfect way to start, and then we can have a conversation about it um, after the public has had a chance to weigh in. Understood. Anyone else? Councilman Carl. Ms. Feely, um, or, or, or Stephen, um, considering the whole monologue that I went through, sorry it was so long, but um, if it, I know you all are looking, you, you're looking at doing some kind of larger process. Um, is this stuff so urgent that we need to move, move this forward before we do the larger process? Or can we wait and include it as part of the larger process that we're going to do, whatever that is? 
At, the, at this time, we have not necessarily finalized what that process is going to look like, but we anticipate that it will take multiple years to actually get through it and, and execute it in the way that you have conveyed to us your expectation is. We're currently in the land use comp plan uh, update process with the Planning Commission. I'm going to be meeting with the Planning Commission tomorrow to talk about what the final phase of that is and what the scope of their consultant is going to be to, to sort of close it out. You heard the presentation from the consultant last week, but that was not that was not the end. There is still a lot more information that we want to present and get your input on and make sure that is meeting the intent that you described in terms of updating the land use plan in a manner that people can visually see and is addressing the concerns about design um, that, that, that you brought up. So um, it, it would be a multi-year process, so we would still want to move forward with this on the interim. Did you want to? I, ju I just would like to add something to that, and I, I wholeheartedly agree. It would be great if we could. PD applications are still being filed. You're still spending two evenings here a month dealing with both alcohol and zoning case requests. Um, there was one just the other day that based on the first vote you took last Thursday night about access to local street no longer needed a PD. So while getting to the bigger picture is critical and important and really shapes the growth of our city, making those smaller steps is also having an impact at, that, at this time for those that are smaller in nature. And I would continue to say that in relationship to this, um, with the exception of the solid waste um, amendment and also I would say the amendments that came from the West Shore Alliance that the city is looking to support in order to enable them to move forward with their vision plans, um, that would be at the discretion of council with the exception of those two. Anyone else? Councilwoman Hurtak, this was your uh, motion. Does this no, it, report? Was, it was Bill Carlson. I'm sorry, Councilman Carlson, this was your motion. Does this satisfy you on the staff report? Yeah, I think I think staff asked me to bring this so up. So just, just to be clear, we, we are requesting action from council, and specifically the action is to move forward with public engagement and then come back with all of that information to present back to you again. So all, that this is just the first step. All we're doing is asking for public engagement. We're yes, not sir. So it. So what, second. And clerk to get that motion. Thank you. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any objection? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. 10 item number eight, file number CM 22 7. There's no public, no public comment. Staff reports. Can I say one more? Mr. Chair, can I just say one more thing? Well, that's open and open. I don't want to say anything about the vote. I just want to say something else. Sure. One, one at a time, Is there no please. Public comment? The, the, these are staff reports. Ms. Sanchez, come forward to the to the, the podium, please. And thank you. I was just wondering if there was public comment. Not during staff reports, no, ma'am. But please, you're standing there. Go no, ahead no, and make your it's public okay. comments. I, I just wanted to give a couple of comments on what I call that tunnel design, and whether the um, garages are facing each other. We have one at 2415 West North A Street. And what happens is people put chairs and plants in front of their doors so they cannot get in to park their cars. So they're using it as a courtyard and their cars are being parked in the street. So the definition between a courtyard and a back and, and the uh, driveway is very, very important to clarify that because depending on how narrow that driveway is, those cars cannot make that 90 degree turn. So they end up parking on the street. So I just want to uh, move forward with that. And I want to thank you all, for, and especially Councilman Hurtak for pushing number nine, the design exception. The design exception that I suggested had to do with transparency. That's the main thing, because that department, and when they make the decisions on the design exception, those are decisions are made, and then you don't know about them until after they happen. So that's what that uh, suggestion I made for the design exceptions, that notification for all of them is because of the necess necessary to have transparency within that department. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to say for, for staff, um, if I, I can't speak for everybody else, but when I ask questions like this, it's not because I'm trying to challenge you or criticize anything, and I thank you for all, all the work. The, the thing is that these, these things are so complex. You all are trained in this. Um, I have a little bit of experience in it, but um, not enough to know the knowledge that you all have. And there are some things, not just in this area, that we've approved in the past where we thought we understood it, and then there are unintended consequences that the public has come back and criticized, criticized us for, and maybe deservedly so. And, and so what we're trying to do is protect you and us from, um, from criticism for the public, but more importantly, we need to make sure we're fully listening to the public to, uh, to reflect their interests and that we're doing the most uh, visionary things we can. So I appreciate all your insights and help. Thank you. Ms. Feely, you were going to say something. Um, yes, counsel, thank you. Abby Feely. Um, it was brought to my attention during the lunch break that item 58, the one with the hotel that had to go back on first reading because of the public notice, should have been scheduled for an evening meeting because the code charter requires that the land use has one evening meeting and one daytime meeting. So I was just going to ask if you could please amend your motion on that. And um, that was item 58 and put it to April 13th at 5.01 p.m. And I apologize second, second. for confusion. We have, we, have, we have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Maniscock. All in favor? Aye. Any yes. opposed? <coughs> motion Good. carries. Thank you very much. Do, do, and if, if, if I may, and, and uh, I'm trying to recall, uh, the last item of agenda we talked about when this was first brought up, eight months ago, I believe it was, wasn't this discussion to save the council time and for smaller things to be in-house decided on? Sir, in relation to the design exceptions yes, that Ms. Sanchez was just speaking to, um, you know, I just want to be clear on that. We've, there has always been an administrative variance power that has resided with the zoning administrator. This was before design exceptions even existed. We used to have two types of variances, administrative variances, which were more de minimis in nature, and then variances that went to the Variance Review Board. When the code was redone in 2008, the administrative variance became the design exception. There are two types of design exceptions. Design exceptions one, which are more de minimis in nature, and design exception two, which is a little larger. There are approval criteria that are contained within the code. The design exception one, the more de minimis, did not require public notice. The design exception two does. The design exception two included setbacks that were non-overlay. And this is the issue that had come up that we started working on back in June. The design exception one with the setbacks and the overlays were not being noticed. So we identified that there was a discrepancy in the level of notice that was being given, and we shifted the setbacks within the overlays that were not getting notice to get notice so they were consistent with the rest of the code. There's no secrecy going on in land development coordination. The administrative variances never had a level of criteria or never had public notice. And it's always been carried through that way. I understand the comment being made that they don't know about it until it's constructed. If we provide public notice and they know about it, it won't necessarily change the criteria under which that's being granted. And, and that's fine. I don't think we have a problem with that. The second level to that conversation became our offices processed 275 <laughs> design exceptions ones in um, 21, and I, I'm sorry, 321 and 275 in 2022. That's 575 applications that could become appeals to you. This board currently takes two review hearings each day hearing, so that's four a month. Those aren't always design exceptions. Today you heard a special use one. That would not have been a DE. That would not have been even in that bucket of potential appeals. 
So when we came back in June, we said to you, let's start with the setbacks because we knew about what number that was going to be. If the desire is to provide public notice on those additional 500, oh, that's not a problem. We can do it. The reality is you could now have appeals that are going out two and three years because if you're only taking four a month, that's only 40 in a year, and that's not only design exceptions. That's VRB appeals, that's formal decision appeals, that's special use appeals. So if that's the desire, we'll move forward with that. We'll get some more numbers together for you in terms of those appeals, and that may be a conversation you need to have amongst yourselves as to do we need to increase now the number of appeals we're going to hear? Do we need to set another day for that? Because it will open that up. Of the ones that we processed that did not receive notice, there were 15 appeals. And those were people who were denied by the zoning administrator, and then they came to seek approval through the appellate, which would be you. So when we bring those things to you and we have those opinions or those recommendations, they come based on the information and us knowing how you process those applications or those appeals and the impact we believe that it would have on you. And we try to balance that with the transparency that is desired by the public. All of those applications, as Eric mentioned last week, and I heard there was some comment on, are published on our interactive application map. They are published in our CARES newsletter. Um, and, and there is a way to know what is going on. Um, but if additional, we think it could be achieved through a combination of things, through a combination of some additional criteria that could go in to say that these administrative approvals would fall within these ranges and some additional public notice for a select number of those applications. Somewhere along the line, I, I use the terms BC and PC, before COVID and post COVID. We had our agendas were stacked and we as a council body were looking for ways to catch up. And I thought that this comment or, or, or this direction came from that, trying to catch up and not take up so much of our time. So I, I thank you, Ms. Feely. Agenda item number eight, CM 22-77743. Good morning, Council, uh, Chief Tripp. Tampa Fire Rescue Fire Chief, and of course we're here to talk about the last motion that uh, basically uh, in reference to uh, City Council and as far as the emergency communication. So I have um, Emergency Manager Coordinator John Antapas is here, and we will give our presentation. And we have some things upon the screen. Good afternoon, Council. I'm going to go over a few slides, a few more add-ons from our last time we met together, and again, going through those recommendations that you were asking for. Uh, as we spoke at the last City Council workshop, uh, this year is our three-year cycle for the update to the Comprehensive Emergency Operations Plan. We actually have our scheduled March 14th kickoff meeting uh, citywide. Some of you may have actually received that invitation. Uh, when we have that kickoff meeting, as we do every single year, um, we go over the scope of work of what's going to be included during this update cycle. We start that early, obviously, because we want to have everything prepared and updated before June 1st and the start of hurricane season. Just as a quick recap of what this plan is, this really is our framework for responding to emergencies, complex emergencies, and special events. It lays out our roles and responsibilities for our different departments and our stakeholders and external agencies that we partner with during emergencies. We also identify our risk and vulnerability to the different hazards that may affect the city of Tampa. We have our key maps, key resources, all as appendices within this document, and then any training and exercise requirements of our staff. I bring up the emergency management cycle, just a bit of an education of why we put together this framework. Again, disasters do not happen every day. This plan, the Comprehensive Emergency Operations Plan, is not for structure fires, highway accidents, law enforcement response, things that happen every day in this city. This is that 5% of the time of those complex incidents 
large scale hurricanes, if you remember back 2020 and even beyond COVID-19, social unrest, the large water main break that we had in November, things that are very complex that multiple departments have to respond to. But within this cycle, uh, as laid out in the National Incident Management System, what came after 9-11 was the na nationwide standards of how we're gonna respond to these complex incidents. And as you see on the slide, uh, it's day to day. Even blue skies, we're taking work together. It's mitigating risks. So again, those actions that we take to harden our fire stations, reduce like the pipes program, reducing uh, flooding and other issues that may occur. We can take those actions today when it's not gray skies out. Then there's the preparedness phase. That's the trainings, the plan updates that we're doing, the exercises we're doing. So that component's in place. Then when the incident does occur, there's the response phase. That's the quick. Uh, fast part, our objective is obviously life safety, protecting property, protecting the environment, and there's actions that need to be taken immediately once that incident does occur. And then we transition out of response into that short-term and long-term recovery, which may take years. After Hurricane Ian, um, we were luckily mostly spared here in the city of Tampa. I was deployed down there to Fort Myers area for about two weeks. And again, that recovery process is still going on today. I was up in Hurricane Michael 2018. That recovery process is still going on. So as you see in that cycle, it's continuous as it goes through those two, four different phases. So diving into the comprehensive emergency operations plan, I wanted to highlight in the org structure, there is the executive policy group. And I think many of you remember back in COVID, there was the EPG between the sheriff, the mayor, um, different elected bodies that was basically putting together the strategic direction. We also have that here at the city of Tampa. Mm -hmm. And here is that layout of who's uh, in the executive policy group. But basically their mission is to provide that strategic direction during an emergency event. So if there's strategic direction coming from the mayor, as well as the administrators and directors, fire chief, police chief, that is direction coming down to the further organization that we're responding to during the emergency. <laughs> as you see there, that's that communication piece to city council through that EPG group, uh, as well as getting that flow of information to and from council to that EPG that then can funnel down to the rest of the response organization. Again, that strategic direction is the key point um, that really comes out of the EPG because all our powers do come directly from the mayor, um, fire chief, police chief, and our emergency responsibilities because the mayor is the public safety official uh, within the city of Tampa. So currently, if you haven't seen the CEOP already, I did want to highlight what is currently in for city council as those responsibilities. Uh, first is to receive regular updates and briefings for the mayor or designee, uh, review and approve and extend declarations of a local state of emergency. I believe in ordinance it is the mayor can declare that local state of emergency, but as extensions are needed past seven days, it does need to be confirmed by city council. Uh, serve as that liaison with other city, county, state, federal, or other government representatives. Serve as that liaison with the community. That's the, one of the biggest points especially as we're getting information that's very dynamic and we're getting that out through our public information officers. If residents are coming to you for information, for, uh, for you all to help amplify that messaging is really a big key point uh, during these emergencies. Conducting public meetings to determine public needs, identify current and future city actions, uh, re review requirements for special legislation and development, establishing executive level policies, and then again, participating in those emergency management trainings. So that's what's currently written in the plan that we have right now. And I bring up this next slide. I did a little bit of research, just looking at different governments around Florida nationwide, just where the legislative body sort of fits in during emergencies. And a lot of this was pulled right from FEMA 402, which is an official training from FEMA for elected officials. And a lot of the language mirrors already what we have in our plan. Um, so I just kind of wanted to highlight that. And I know there was some discussion at the last workshop of, your, of the role of city council. And, and one thing I just wanted to highlight, you know, during the, during the response phase specifically, it is a very dynamic situation. And in the National Incident Management System, there's a concept called incident command system. And the, the point of that is to organize effectively a response to an emergency. And ultimately, the incident commander at the top is responsible for that incident. And the reason why you wanna do that because of the dynamically changing information, setting objectives, and because of things rapidly changing, you really need one individual to be able to take action during that response phase. So as uh, the, the FEMA 402 really stated was, you know, the strategic direction comes from you from council. 
But again, as a hurricane's coming, decisions need to be made quickly, and there really needs to be one point person to begin to make those decisions, and then everyone that falls underneath that org structure can follow through with meeting those objectives. So I stated I was going to give uh, recommendations between those four phases. So going into preparedness, um, you know, through this cycle with the comprehensive emergency management update, um, the preparedness cycle for city council, some recommendations would be, you know, participate in those emergency trainings, incident command system training. FEMA has a lot of these online. We also host these at the convention center. We have one going on currently at the Hillsborough County EOC, but there's ICS classes that can get you familiar with the system, how we adopt it. We don't develop this plan just as the city of Tampa. There are national standards that we do implement in our plan and it's all relayed back to that national incident management system. So I would encourage if you have some time to take some of these trainings, it would be great. Another one, support and preparedness community outreach events. We do these throughout the year. The more prepared our community is, the easier our job is gonna be. So any support we can get at these community events, I do meetings down in South of Gandy, East Tampa, West Tampa, all over the city, but getting out that hurricane preparedness messaging is gonna make our lives and our jobs a lot easier. Um, appropriating funding for emergency exercises, training, sharing pertinent information, as I said, as public information officers are getting out that information. We, uh, throughout the year on social media, on Alert Tampa, we're putting out preparedness messages. If you can reshare those messages, again, making our community more resilient. And then last night we had our kickoff for our spring community emergency response team, which is our group of volunteers that we train up and are potentially available to us during an emergency. We do background checks with those individuals as well, but we we've have been since 2021, we revamped that program. This is our sixth class. Um, if you all would like to attend that or promote that to your within your districts for residents to attend those trainings, again, we continue to want to beef up our volunteer support, whether it's giving out sandbags, um, working at shelters or additional needs during an emergency. We use them during Gasparilla as well. We do have this volunteer services there. Then on the response side, again, uh, alluded to before, um, receiving briefings from the EPG and EOC. Uh, we have you all set up in the Everbridge emergency notification system. So anytime the EPG needs to send, a, send out a notification directly to city council, we have that set up already to get that information out to you quickly during that response phase. A big part, again, communicating and amplifying our messaging that's being pushed out by our public information officers. And again, that we have one unified message as a city government. Uh, directing resident questions. If you get questions that are coming directly to you, when we activate our emergency operations center, we do have our citizen information center that's activated as well, and residents can call that line at 833-TPA-INFO and get more information. During Hurricane Ian, many folks were looking for where the nearest shelter was, what their evacuation zone was, and I'm sure you had a lot of questions directed your way, but if you direct them to that line, we can get the latest, greatest, best information out to them. And then to wrap up on the phases, on the recovery side, and this is a, a, a big part of Southwest Florida where the legislative bodies really play a heavy role, is that short-term and long-term recovery. All those issues, again, once the response side goes down, the life safety issues are, are, are dealt with, there is gonna be a long-term recovery, especially during a hurricane event. And housing needs, land use needs, economic recovery. Again, a major catastrophic hurricane hit in our area is gonna take years, if not decade, to rebuild from that. And that direction, strategic direction, really comes from city council on how we would rebuild and, and really that balance of how quickly to how much more resiliently we're gonna be for the next storm down the line. Again, 102 years we haven't been hit. A lot of old building stock here. I live in the city of Tampa. I live in South Tampa area. I was on Pine Island, um, which is near the Fort Mon near Sanibel Island. I couldn't help but not think of South Tampa. Um, you're on that island, and again, the devastation that was there, it's gonna take years and years and years to rebuild from that. Um, so definitely a huge role during the recovery. And then uh, we also have one other project that's gonna be kicking off this year is our post-disaster redevelopment planning. And again, to try to capture some of these concepts and direction that we want when that catastrophic day happens. So we have that written down ahead of time. And again, we can make adjustments after the incident, but again, getting our ducks in the row and being more prepared on the front end is gonna make our life much easier um, when one of these disasters does happen here. Oops, sorry, and then, and then mitigation. That's the big one too. Blue skies every day. The more investment we do in mitigation activities reduces our risk to being impacted by emergencies. 
One of the big FEMA stats they always throw out there is $1 in mitigation saves $6 during response. So when we harden our fire stations, our police department, our critical infrastructure, it's gonna make us more resilient that when that storm does come, it's gonna be less of an impact to us. And uh, one other thing I did wanna note, the state of Florida has that My Florida Safe program. If you haven't heard of it, that is up to $10,000 dollar to dollar match for residents to harden their, their homes. So if they wanna win retrofit their windows, that is a statewide program that's out there. And one of the great parts of that program, they will actually send an inspector out to your house for free and do that analysis of how to harden your facility as well. And that's the presentation, but I'll open any questions. Councilman Good. Mr. Chairman, uh, with all due respect, I think it was a great presentation for the community to hear what you had to say, uh, but it didn't go into what the actual request from this council. And I'm going to read it. It said, uh, for staff to provide an update on some recommendations for a city council, in addition to talking about some of the other changes that might be coming pertaining to protocol and communication with city council during emergency situations. I, I didn't see that in the presentation. It was in the EPG slide. So for the communication piece from that executive policy group, at my level and the operations level, I wouldn't be directly communicating to city council unless directed by Fire Chief Barbara Tripp or the mayor. Um, but we have that system in place with Everbridge, like I explained last time, that we can direct those direct messages. But that EPG itself, There'll be assignment, and, and if you remember, Andrew Zellman was speaking up about texting last time. We're going to make that a more formal role that as part of that EPG, regular updates will be coming beyond our situation reports and other information that we push out. But the EPG itself communicates with city council. Okay, well, I don't know. I've I never heard of EPG. we never used that. It's never come directly to us. So I guess council want to know if something's going in the city, if it's coming from the mayor or whatever, council's saying that we want to be notified at the same time versus we hanging down here last. That's what we're asking. So I don't see that in the presentation. So I think council is saying that when it's happening, we don't want to hear from our constituents. We want to know what's happening real time. So I can say with this last situation in which we are in the process of uh, uh, speaking with Hillsborough County as far as to notice, I believe Council Member um, Carson had mentioned that some people knew about uh, Pinellas County being evacuated. And of course, we wasn't familiar with that. When we uh, went over to do a press conference, that's when we found out about it. And we didn't even know they was in the process of evacuating um, certain areas. So we are in the process of talking with Hillsborough County because of course, when they claim you know, state of an emergency, of course, we're involved in it, but we didn't get involved in that particular situation, this last situation, until the 11th hour. Well, and we didn't talk about that one. I'm talking about when Tico was talking about shutting the power out. We didn't know about that until the ninth hour. Someone called and said, well, you know, they're going to shut the power down on Davis Island and the islands, you know? So, I mean, I thought, I mean, council should know if they're going to shut power down to the city somewhere. Yeah, I didn't know what this was. Yeah, and that wasn't the city of Tampa that shut down the power. That was a TICO preventive measure. But the one, well, one that's not what I'm saying. Yep. You knew about it, though. But what I would say is that situation, we did, but there's a lot of dynamic information. That came very quickly after the decision was already made by TICO. So, again, again, very dynamic situations. Hurricane coming, information's changing by the minute. So as that, for that specific example, that decision was already made by TICO to do it and was relayed to us by the state. But we, I understand that. But you, you guys are still missing the, the, the piece we're saying. I, I just don't understand. We're saying is still, it might have happened, but when were we going to be notified that it happened? That's the point I'm trying to make. We're always last to know anything, but we're for the first calls that our constituents and the public makes is to this council. They don't make it to the mayor. They make it to us, and that's what we're saying. We don't care about the executive order of the chief, of the mayor making the order. We just want to make sure that we're in the loop when those orders are being made. That's what we're saying. I can tell you what we can do because, like I say, it's forced communication through the Everbridge and the notices and stuff. Whenever we get something, we'll just start pushing it out to you all. You know, it's everything that we get. Now, us, once you know. again, when you say notify you, you know, we gonna you want us to notify you of I don't mean it like everything that take place in the city, but it's a, if it's an emergency situation, then we will go ahead and put it on every bridge and notify all the city council. I That's going to be the best we way we to do been it. invited to the EOC building. I thought that was supposed to happen a long time ago, and this never happened. 
Well, I thought it was something with the sunshine situation. I mean, the sunshine, know. we brought on the place where this council's gone and, and viewed that place or, or other or the issues. I mean, we always thought the sunshine in. We can do whatever we want to do we want to do it. There's no reason that this council can't be able to go over there, have a record or whatever, and go over there and, and view that place over there to see how it operates over there. Okay. I mean, just let me know how the rules are going. We'll, we'll make it happen. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, th this is what I was going to say, too. Um, um, I appreciate all the, all the hard work you put into putting this, and it's great it's information great. for us and the public. It doesn't answer the question. And I, I, I talked to Chief of Staff at lunch. Um, if I make a motion, and I don't know about my colleagues, but if I make a motion, and maybe I should take the initiative or you all can take the initiative, but I think that we ought to have a conversation before staff puts together a long presentation. Like, remember the thing, the problem we had on the incinerator, it took three meetings to get the answer. And if somebody had called me and said, uh, I, I think this motion was very, pretty specific, um, as you just read it again, but, um, and I think my motion on incinerator was specific too, but I think if, if we have a conversation after the motion sometime in the next few days afterwards, we can save a lot of time because then we can explain what the intent was and, and you wouldn't have to put together a long presentation like this. It's, to me, it's, it's, it's maybe a much simpler answer. So one, structurally, um, either we need a protocol where we'll reach out to, I don't even know who the staff person might be. In this case, I think it should have been the chief of staff probably presenting. Um, and, <clears throat> or we can, uh, or you all can reach out to us. Uh, the second thing, and I, I think I did describe this one or two times ago when we talked about this, is that, um, uh, you know, the, if, there's a, if there's a shooting in one of our districts, at least I don't get a call about it. Um, uh, I see, now we're on the, the, the um, PIO of the, of the police, and so we are getting that. Um, we are getting, I think, the same thing for fire. So we are getting some updates, which I appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. So and and the PIO fire is better than police, but there's a lot of um, a lot of spin going on in there too. When we need to know the information, we need to know it quickly. The other thing is is um, is I think a matter of respect. Like, and, and I I would look at the county commission maybe more than this. But I think there's a presumption that because we have an executive, I'm not going to use strong mayor anymore, because we have an, 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 a separately elected mayor and the mayor is the, in the executive position that runs things in emergency, that somehow city council gets pushed aside. In the hurricane, there was a great chance that my district was going to be completely underwater, that my house was going to get wiped out and all my neighbors are going to get wiped out. And nobody reached out to us all we barely got any information and all of this that you mentioned would give us a little bit more information but if we were a county commission i think we all would get equal information and maybe there's some level that the mayor gets that we don't get but it felt very disrespectful for one that we didn't get any information nobody reached out to even ask me what was going on um, there's no protocol for who who we should talk to um, Chief of Staff did text a couple times, but but there was no separate substantive information. We are, we are the the, the role of the mayor and city council are different, uh, but the, but one is not less important than the other. We both have to function in an emergency, and in in situations like COVID and um, and a devastating hurricane, we still have to figure out how to operate the city. And I I don't accept that we just have an executive order and suddenly the city council is pushed aside and we don't have any role anymore. And so this this doesn't answer that question. I hope that chief of staff or somebody will come up with it, but after the next hurricane, if it happens again, then we'll we'll have this discussion again, I guess. Thank you. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. And, and my, my comment is just very narrowly tailored on something. I, I thank you guys for your report and, and uh, all the work that went in. I know there's some issues on whether or not it was tailored to the request, but I thank you guys for it, as I'm sure we all do. The one thing I do want to mention, which is volunteer services were brought up. Um, I, I, I just, again, I don't, it's not under y'all, just general for the administration, that whenever it comes to sandbags, mm -hmm. to make sure to go into volunteers, because I, I was out at the, at, the uh, at a park doing sandbags with my wife for two, two and a half hours, and it was awful. I mean, it was, and when I say awful, I don't mean any critique of anybody, just the, the, the conditions for people there. And there's so many people in neighborhood groups, 
uh, throughout the city of Tampa, rotary clubs, churches, synagogues, mosques, et cetera. Um, I, I, and, I, and I would say the time is now to begin to just contact key folks and go, hey, listen, with John, I know there's legal issues with like release of liability because someone's going to strain their back. God knows I did. Um, but, um, but that's what I'd say. Just, just I was actually talking to a city worker about it two nights ago, in fact, who I remembered from the uh, sandbag thing. So that's why I just wanted to say that just not for y'all necessarily, but just for the administration that I, I think now is the time to start making those uh, connections. And if I can be of any assistance, I'm glad to help. Thank you. And we are. I'm sorry. Chief, I apologize. No, 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 I apologize. So, so we are in process now of planning ahead because we're actually having our first um, in May. We're going to do like a hurricane preparedness to start getting people prepared early and not wait until the time come. And we're going to have a lot of information in, out there about sandbags and hurricane kits and everything and how to go ahead and t continue to prepare. But we also have a, um, a platform that's called Web EOC as well. Now we can give you all access so you can see what's in there. You know, if you guys want training on that, you know, when we talk about, you know, making you all aware of things that happen in the city, to be honest with you, fire, you know, because my staff, my PO would tell me, hey, we just had a fire last night, as well as me getting a page. You know, a lot of them just a typical pot on the stove or something minor, you know, and of course we put media alert out. Now, when it comes to law enforcement, a lot of those situations take place. Uh, Chief <laughs> Trip don't get knowledge of that as well. Now, when we talk about natural disasters and stuff moving forward, as for as shutdown of, you know, power in a certain area, you know, we'll be more than happy to change the process or to implement or to look into a process of when something come up that's critical that's relating to a, um, a neighborhood or your district. You know, we can send that information out. That, you know, whether it be via you know, the uh, Everbridge, you know, or if you want the Web EOC, if you want us to put in Web EOC and you, you know, look into that to see what's going on. Because I, I, I understand the message and I understand what we presented here, but we was trying to say, you know, as far as recommendation, as far as preparedness, we're saying if something is happening in the neighborhood, you guys should be notified. <coughs> You are right, but to what level? You know, do you want to know everything or do you want to know the critical stuff? Because we have things happening in our neighborhood 24 seven, you know? So if you want to know when we know it, three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, you know, to be paged, you know, any of that stuff. So we, I just want you all to be a little bit more clear with us so we'll make sure we give you guys the correct information, you know, or the notification. It's not that we're trying to keep you out of what's going on in the city. You know, you should be aware, especially if it involves your community. You know, but I don't want to disturb you two o'clock in the morning for something little minor, you know, but if you want to know everything that I, or when I say I mean in fire, you know, or is involved with in the neighborhood, I have no problem. We can push that information out, you know, towards um, whether we use Everbridge or WebBLC and make it available to you. Did you want to say something about the, we get the web? Yeah, just one other thing to add with WebBOC, that is our information management platform. So requests from different departments and significant events during that emergency, we <laughs> capture that in there. So I think we could build out a board for city council to at least view those significant things. And we'll just need to figure out what level we want to add to because, you know, we transported assisted living facility patients throughout the storm, things at that level. But if that is the threshold that you want to know that detailed information and obviously the TECO power outage because of how many residents that did impact. Um, but just to keep in mind, it is a very dynamically changing situation when we're in these moments and information changes every minute. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I would honestly say that, uh, you know, I appreciate this and I understand that we're all trying to figure out the way this all works. Um, but I would 100% say that I would rather have more information rather than less information um, when it comes to this because I got a lot of um, complaints, not complaints, but concerns because the, the phone line was backed up. People couldn't get through. So they were messaging me, they were messaging other folks just trying to find the information. And you know, if I had had the information, I could pass it along. I mean, I may not know every answer, but if I know a quarter of the answers, that's a quarter fewer phone calls. Uh, but we didn't have that information. So, uh, you know, and I can't speak for others, but I was on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, literally every, just following along so I could send that information out. So I appreciate that, and that was great to send out to people, but to have a little bit more understanding for, uh, for our residents um, that, that are contacting us, um, 
because they contact us the same way they contact the info line. Yeah. We are basically another info line. Uh, and if a way to figure out uh, the uh, level of information we need to know, again, it doesn't have to be information that we share, but just, hey, in the back of our head, we know, oh, Tico is, is thinking about closing. Or once you got that notification, just say, oh, Tico's planning on closing this. And then, so if we know residents are still in a tower somewhere, mm -hmm. we can really make sure that folks know that they aren't playing, that the power is going off. Um, and sometimes we have that relationship that, you know, a public service message, message doesn't. So. And sometimes, to be honest with you, like you said with the TICO, we, we don't get that message too. So you guys might hear something out there in the street that we don't even hear. You know, we hear it after, you know, maybe the next day or we might hear it on the news or something. So a lot of the information, that's why I said we had a little bit more uh, clarification of what you expect, what you want. And if we have it, we'll have no problem sharing it with you, you know. But I don't want you to think that we're trying to hold something you know, because we didn't know Tico was closing this down until the 11th hour, you know, and it's, you know, um, I mean, it's like a train derailment or something, you know, a lot of times that's something if it happened locally, you know, or if it affected traffic coming in, you know, we might find out through our dispatch system, you know. So you guys let us know what you, you know, if there's anything in particular, but like I said, if we get the information, we can share it, but if we don't get it until the 11th hour, you might hear from, you know, a contingent you know, before we able to put that information out, or they might know more information than we do. Sure, and you know, like you said, that uh, a situation like a hurricane is is always changing. But I would love to learn about the EOC web, web EOC web EOC. Mm -hmm. So that's a website, not like something you can get on your phone or. Yeah, it's a it's a URL you go to, so it's in the cloud. Oh, okay, yes, okay, yes. great. Uh, but I think um, I can't speak for the others, but I think that would be really valuable to at least get the training for um, so if something were to happen because again I mean we're thinking about a hurricane but the reality is um, we also have things that could possibly happen what happens if there's a mass shooting what happens if there's you know um, we just had that exp uh, those train cars that fell over in Sarasota County what if something like that were to happen here how do we get the information as quickly as possible and if, if you're saying the EOC Web EOC is a way to do that, then I am 100% um, happy to take a training and learn how that works. Is that a good place to start? Good place, but the bottom line is when they know, like I said, they're two different systems. They have a, they have a staff page that goes out when a major incident happens in the city. Then they have a media, a media alert page. We are now getting the media stuff. We don't get the real time, we get the after notification. You know, if I got a major shooting over, I got a bunch of shootings. The people come to my house, I come to the funeral, knock on the door, counting the shooting down the street. So I told the major, what is a shooting? I want to know about those shootings. Because those are major incidents in the city. And those kind of major incidents in a district that we have, we need to know about these things. You know, fire arrives, they arrive at a shooting, no different than the police arrive at, arrive at a shooting. We don't, I don't need to go to investigative melee uh, behind it. Just if there's a shooting, it's a shooting in 15th and Osborne. We got three injured, one dead, seen and secure. Now I know somebody called me. The community is safe, they're, they're investigating. Those are simple things. Yeah. Okay. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, just real fast. Uh, um, it, it, part of it is communication. Part of it is what is the role of city council in COVID and in the hurricane? Uh, the, the feedback we got was there's an executive order, emergency order, the mayor's in charge. You're out, you're unplugged. Um, and um, there has to there has to be a protocol for something. I mean, what happens if South Tampa? I'm just saying, what happens if South Tampa and downtown get wiped out? Like, what happens if City Hall is wiped out? What are, where are we going to go? Where are we going to do? What are, what is our role? Um, are we supposed to be the higher ground and be available in case something happens, or are we supposed to be shoveling sand? Or are we <laughs> supposed to? I mean, there, there's no protocol at all. I'm not asking for the, the answer now, but but um, the thing I mentioned when we first brought this up is that. A group of PR people and I don't know who else drove with the mayor from the EOC building all the way to Bayshore Boulevard and got out of the car during the storm with a dog, took a video, took that video back and edited it and posted it all over the internet. But none of us got a phone call from anybody. And and our districts were potentially being destroyed. So the point is that is that City Council is one of two branches in the in the in the 
charter and a government, and we need to have a protocol and a, and a communication, not just the same text messages that everybody else gets. Because we are responsible when these things are going on. People expect us to know and be involved in some way. And although an, an emergency order may officially put the mayor in charge, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be communicated with all. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtown. Is there a way then that we could be they, on? They have a staff page that goes out to all, all administrators, especially the police department. Then you have a media alert that some, the police department, they'll send out a DIL media call, they'll, they'll send that out, or their communicate person will send that out. There's several different methods they use, but for all city type uh, level executives, is, there's a staff page that goes out. Is there, a, could we get on that staff page? Um, I don't know about that page. The only page that I'm on is what's pertained to Tampa Fire Rescue. So the pages that I get is when, I don't get a page every time there's a call go out. I get a page, it's certain different codes that I get a page on. So if it's a structure fire, if it's a work and structure fire, because we have to have so many, when I say staff, if it's a second alarm fire, we have to have staff there, third alarm. So those are the pages I get. Every call, because I'm gonna tell you right now, we run close to 100,000 calls. You know, and we get them all the time. So I don't get all of those pages. No, you I'm know. not talking about you. I'm just saying, that, but I know there's a general executive page that goes up for anything maybe in the city. Yeah. Well, I'm not on that one. Maybe I'm not on. Know. I'm not on. I don't know anything about that. Customary that it is a staff page, but maybe so. I don't know anything about the staff page. So I, like I say, the pages that I get that come from my communication concerning, you know, Fine. certain group pages of people that have to be on there to, for awareness. Correct. Um, can you inquire about that? Inquire about the pages. Yeah. Yeah, my page or the. Um, um, just I don't know. Maybe we need chief of staff here to answer the to find out what what we. I mean, if there's already a page system that goes out that kind of just does emergencies, we should probably be on that instead of getting the media alerts. I don't know. <clears throat> the media alerts too. Well, both. I mean. But, uh, but yes, often the media alerts happen after, and I'll be honest, I usually see them on, on social media before I get the email. <laughs> Told you. Um, Press release, city council is invited, and the meeting was two hours ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. so well, Ms. Elman is here, maybe she do can we, Do questions. we want to have any further motion on this, or just leave it where it is? Ms. Elman is here. She's the, uh, she's the attorney. Maybe she can ask that question. <coughs> or something. Chief Tripp, please don't leave. I, I want to have final comments, if I may, please. And thank you. Andrea Elman, City Attorney. The only thing I can add, th this Hurricane Ian was the first emergency um, that occurred after I became city attorney. I sense an implication here that there's things the mayor knew that you didn't know. I didn't see any of that. You know, we live in a time now where with Twitter and social media and all that news is coming at us fast and furious. The information I saw, and I was getting things from, from John, I, I'm on web EOC during an emergency. I was at the EOC during the hurricane. I was texting with the chief of staff. Then at the EOC, I was there with everyone. We were getting the information and immediately pushing it out to you all. That was one of the things Chief Bennett and I did, was make sure we were keeping city council up to date. So this, this suggestion that there's all this information that the mayor is privy to that you're not getting just isn't true. It just isn't true. We were pushing out the information as we were getting it. The city doesn't make the decision to evacuate. Hillsborough County does. As soon as Hillsborough County said anything about evacuation, we started pushing that information to you guys. Other people were pushing it out to the media. I mean, it, it, as John said, it was dynamic, it was fluid, it was happening. So I, I'm, I'm struggling with this suggestion that there was information being withheld from any of you. I, I can't speak to shootings or fires or whatever. I'm not privy to all that, but I can speak to how the hurricane emergency played out because I was there. So. That you were finished, but go ahead, Councilor Carlson. Yeah, just, just final, final thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, uh, I, I don't know what I'm not getting, uh, and, and, and I agree. That's you what and I'm Chief, trying to tell you. Yeah, there you, really isn't anything you and you're Chief not of staff, getting. You and Chief of Staff and, and even Gina 
after we talked about this during COVID and, and BLM did a, did a better job. I mean, during BLM, we didn't get, uh, we were begging for updates and we didn't get them. Um, so a lot has changed, it has gotten better. The second thing is there also is two-way communication and uh, we need a protocol for that. But the, the bigger thing that, that I'm asking for, which was in there is what's the, what's the protocol? Um, I imagine when a storm comes, that there's some instruction somewhere overlaying everything that the mayor gets whisked away to this building and and then um, and then she, she's supposed to do something. We don't have any idea what we're even supposed to do. Some people went in bag sand, some uh, had to evacuate, some, I mean, we, we, I'm not trying to answer it right now, but there's no protocol for at all for city council. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what to do, everybody just makes it up. You know, what is, what is the role? Are we supposed to be sitting out there helping uh, helping people um, uh, get out of their houses when there's flooding, or are we supposed to stay out of the way of the of the fire rescue people? Um, so anyway, that, uh, some other time, if somebody else wants to answer, we'll we'll get it. Any other comments? Thank you both for this report, and and as my com my colleagues have said, that we we need to know information. But there are times when we have to take the initiatives ourselves. When this city shut down for Ian, this council member wanted to know what was going on constantly. So yes, I went from going and shoveling sand over 200 bags for the residents so that they could be protected in their homes. After that, I took the initiative to ask to be at the EOC, where I saw city staff up 24-7. From there, I went to roll calls at Raymond James Stadium. The next day, went out and did the same thing. So our, our city council needs to take initiatives also. But we do need information. Thank you both. Agenda item number nine, file number CM22-77965. Good afternoon, Council Morris Massey, Legal Department. Um, you received a memo and a draft ordinance in response to uh, Councilman Carlson's motion regarding codifying the uh, honorary naming process that uh, was contained in an executive order issued by the mayor. This draft ordinance is intended to do that, provides a direct path for Council to go ahead and propose honorary naming of uh, city buildings, parks, uh, rooms, that sort of thing on the same basis. Um, I did have a conversation with Councilman Carlson where he suggested some additional criteria be added and also uh, come up with a public notice process so that everyone's aware of when an application is made so comments can be submitted, whether it's through the mayor's office or directly to you all. And um, I'm happy to start working on that and come forward, uh, I would suggest maybe on April 6th with a revised ordinance addressing this point. So I'm happy to answer any of your questions. So well. moved. To the mo mo Mr. Chairman. Councilman Carlson. The motion would be to um, ask uh, legal to bring back on April 6th for first reading an ordinance that would include the the, the two small amendments that that he just that Morris just discussed. One would would include um, public notice um, to get public feedback uh, before um, before making the final decision. The other one would be just some additional criteria um, for screening to make sure you have the right candidate. Second. Motion made by Councilman Carlson. Second by Councilman Maniscock. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I don't have a problem with that, but you know, uh, when you talk about people who do good work, somebody might have passed the discretion in the past, but they, the good work they've done that have overshadowed something somebody had done 30, 40 years ago. So I don't want to make sure we just, you know, saying because somebody yep. did something in the past when they don't like that they did, they get discredited and can't get something. C Councilman Goods, and I understand, I understand that. What this ordinance provides for actually is that. <coughs> there may be exceptions that need, need to be made to the criteria. And what it does call for is that if there needs to be an exception, then both you all and the mayor both have to agree to make that exception, really. That, so that's what this really is set up saying. If, if somebody meets the criteria, 
then it automatically comes to you all. If you all made the motion or, I, or goes through the mayor's office, if the mayor wants to have it done, and neither party really stops it. But if somebody wants to name something after somebody and that person doesn't meet the criteria in the ordinance, then both of you all have to agree to that. that so that's, that's basically how it's set up. No. Thank you. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, just a, just a quick comment to thank um, Morris and Andrea and the mayor and anybody else who was involved in this. Um, they're, um, at least I'm having a lot of conversations behind the scenes to try to make sure we can all forge a, a new path going forward. And I think, I think legal, there's a new attitude in legal that is, that is more collaborative and creative at solution making. And we went where we, if you look at where we started on this and where we ended, um, at least for right now, it's, it's light years ahead of where we were. And I think the solution that you all came up with is, is a good one. It's not perfect for either, either side, but it is a, a great uh, and creative solution. So thank you. Understood. Yes. Agenda item number 10, file number CM22 74623. Andrea Zelman, City Attorney. Um, so this is my response to the motion regarding um, the request that I prepare. Originally, it was for a draft ordinance regarding notice of um, notice to city council of civil <coughs> rights investigations or other law enforcement investigations of the city of Tampa. And I had a good conversation with Councilman Carlson and Mr. Shelby yesterday, but since all of you weren't, weren't privy to it, okay, we do have four. I just all of a sudden looked and there were a lot of blank spaces. Um, I just wanted to reiterate some of the points that we discussed, and that is that as a general rule, when people, or in this case, the city of Tampa is the subject of an investigation, most legal counsel, crisis management teams, whatever, would advise that person, or in this case, that entity, to not discuss it in public. Um, you don't do that for several reasons. You don't want to litigate the case in public. Disclosing the fact that there is an investigation could jeopardize the um, litigation or potential litigation arising from the subject matter. You don't want to inadvertently say something that could be used against you or in this case against the city um, and that could impact the investigation. And of course, you have to balance our desire for transparency and our desire for conducting government in the sunshine against the, these reasons that when it comes to investigations, the preference is to maintain confidentiality. And in the instance that kind of drove this, this motion and this request, you know, again, as you all are now aware, in December of 2021, the Department of Justice sent a letter to the city notifying the city that it was going to investigate the former crime-free multi-housing, multi-family housing program um, for possible civil rights violations. Um, and at the time, the city retained outside counsel. We have an attorney in Washington who's working with us on this case. And his advice to the mayor at that time was what I just said. You don't talk about it publicly. You don't want to litigate it in public so on and so forth. And as a result, the only people at the city that were even aware that the city had received the letter were those who had to know because the letter also included a request for information. So there was a team that had to assemble that information. I was not privy to that information. I didn't know about it until months later um, when it ended up becoming public. I would also note that the Department of Justice itself has a written policy about 
not announcing investigations. They have some limited exceptions when they do, but generally it's their policy not to announce that they're conducting an investigation, and they didn't in this case. They have never publicly announced that they're investigating the city of Tampa. And if you look at their policy, some of the reasons they give are the same as what I said, but they also point out that it could make it more difficult for them to get cooperation from a witness um, if that witness is aware that there's a big investigation going on, and they also just don't want to prejudice the outcome. Another factor you have to keep in mind when it comes to the city is publicity surrounding an investigation um, could impact our credit ratings and make it difficult for the city to borrow money. So. The point being, it's, it's not in the best interest of the city of Tampa to make public the fact that the city is under an investigation such as this one. So the issue that I was grappling with was, you know, this council's request to be made aware and how do we balance that against the need to maintain confidentiality as much as possible. And I would also note that you know, you have a rule in your rules of procedure about not discussing in a public meeting pending litigation or something that may result in litigation. And, you know, the worst case scenario at the end of a Department of Justice investigation would be the city being sued by the Department of Justice. Of course, we hope that doesn't happen, but that is what, what is the ending of that process should they find reason to believe we violated federal statutes. So, you know, again, just as with um, our general, you know, your rule about not discussing pending litigation or things that may result in litigation, we suggest, you know, having one-on-one -on -one conversations rather than announcing it at a public meeting. So the, the process that Councilman Carlson and Mr. Shelby and I discussed and what I think is a workable compromise, and I hope you'll agree, is that in the event that the city is notified again, and, and as I told both of them, this is really forward-looking. You know, we've, this, to my knowledge, the city has had two um, investigations, one per decade, the last decade and this decade, and hopefully by the time, if ever, the city is the subject of an investigation again, we'll all be long gone. But in any event, should that happen again, um, the process would be that the city attorney's office, if the mayor wants to participate, he, she or he can, but, but it probably should be the city attorney's office, would have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the individual council members, um, and then would explain the need for confidentiality and all the reasons I just described, and ask the council member to sign some sort of agreement acknowledging their duty to protect the interests of the city of Tampa and not disclose the existence of the investigation um, in order to be advised that there is in fact an investigation. And the concept that we discussed would be outlining this process in a resolution that council would adopt and there'd be a companion executive order of the, the mayor agreeing to this process. And I did run this by her and she um, was amenable to that. So again, you know, in our discussion, we, we came up with this proposal as being something that's in the best interest of the city and also in the interest of transparency um, for uh, the city of Tampa, the citizens of the city of Tampa. And again, there's, you know, there's factors we would need to work in there. We can't in any way use this as a way to avoid any other obligations we may have under public records law or sunshine law, but, but to the extent that there's an ongoing investigation, the public records laws do recognize exemptions in many cases depending on the facts, depending on where in the investigation the process is in, so this is, this is not novel. And again, it's consistent with the general rule that it just generally is not a good idea to publicly discuss an investigation while it is happening. And finally, I would note that the investigation I referred to earlier is still underway. As I mentioned at an earlier 
meeting, we don't get um, information about how it's going or what they're finding or anything like that. So it's, it's ongoing. That's as much as I want to say about it now, and that's really as much as I know about it now. So with that, Mr. Carlson, I'm sorry. Councilman Charles. Yeah, I, I just want to say the same thing I said on the last one, um, to thank you and the mayor and whoever else worked on this for um, coming up, being thoughtful and coming up with what I think is a good solution. No solution, for the most part, is perfect, but this is, I, I think, a really good solution. The idea here is that there are two brands of government. If something serious happens or could happen that will affect our decision-making ability, we need to be aware of it. And I think this is a, a, a great solution you come up with. So pen, uh, barring any uh, objections, I would, I think, do the same thing I did on the last one, which is to make a motion to have you come back. So, so we have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Goods. Well, I need to set a date, and when, when do you want to come back with, for? It, it, oh, we I, decided on a resolution instead of an ordinance, right? A resolution and a mayor's executive order, and I'd, I'd like to, as a matter of personal preference, ask that it not be April 6th, because there's, that's the week of what date Passover would you like? and Good Friday and all that, and that's just a difficult week. What date would you like? Whatever the next meeting is after that. Uh, 20th, so re to return on April 20th with a, um, a resolution for approval. Yeah, re 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 yeah. Twentieth. Okay. Motion made by Councilman Cross and seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Mr. Shelby, you wanted to briefly discuss uh Agenda item number 12. Yes. <laughs> Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Very briefly, Council, um, I am uh, preparing the, the uh, draft ordinance based on Council's motion, but I'd like some clarification, Council, because the motion is very specific to Chapter 119, and that is the public records law. Also, the motion mentions recommendations on private liability insurance. We have had that discussion in the past. I prepared a memo, Council, and I'm asking for a, uh, a short continuance to make revisions to this ordinance um, based upon a recommendation uh, regarding the funding source and expanding the scope beyond public records to include civil actions and uh, allegations of code of ethics violations. And my recommendation is to fund this or have it be funded through a risk management fund provided by the city and to include civil actions related to the performance of official duties that serve a public purpose in addition to any coverage or recovery of legal expenses as provided by state law. So that is my recommendation. So again, mm -hmm. it, it, okay. Um, the question would be, uh, how soon does council want this? Because if I, I can do this, if I get it done by next week, it'll make it in two weeks, if that's council's pleasure. Do you want it sooner than, than um, two weeks is fine? Okay. So that would be, that would work. March 16th. We have a motion made by Councilman Goode, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion mm. passes. One other subject which hadn't come up, but in my research and, and, and my looking at other jurisdictions, the question is whether Council wants to expand this to include those on appointed boards, as I've seen in other jurisdictions, but that could be for another time, another uh, expansion of that ordinance, unless Council feels that they wish to do that. Okay. Is that a general consensus? Let's, Let's get the structure. You yeah. got, okay, understood. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Agenda item 13, file number CM 23 79781. 
Yes, again, Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Items 13 and 14 are uh, pretty much combined into one document. Um, I just want to talk very briefly about clarifications on uh, item 13. Um, and again, as I said in my memo to you, um, in preparing these changes, I've included revisions to be consistent with the consensus of City Council and its many discussions and in the conduct of the meetings, um, uh, particularly, let's say, the special discussion meeting that you had on uh, the, uh, the order of business and the like. So with regard to item 13, I just want to point out one thing to City Council, which in fact is a change that I had made, and I want to make sure that's acceptable and consistent with Council's desire. It says to allow, if you look at item um, uh, number 13, it says to allow five minutes for special presentations with additional five minutes for each Council comment, and that is reflected in, uh, in rule, that's in rule three, through rule three um, uh, B two, the order of business, excuse me, three, ba, five, it's um, rule three B five, and what it says is um, staff reports, let me just make sure I get this right. That's actually, um, yes, it says that the, um, it shall be limited to five minutes for each subject followed by council's questions or comments. And the question that I have is uh, that's, uh, that's not for staff reports, that's for presentations. Hold on a second. Okay, to be brief. <clears throat> the, the question where I had a concern, Council, is the one comment that was made in the motion the way it's been recorded is for special presentations, five minutes, oh, for commendations to allow, I'm sorry, to allow only three minute commendations for each minute meeting with no comments by Council. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure that that was exactly Council's, so for instance, at today's commendation, Council, you had comments, and I'm not familiar with. It. I, I'm not. Yes, it's going to be fine. Well, I need. In reality, council, one of the things that, if you notice from here, with regard to the time for public comment, the 30-minute rule has never, ever, ever been kept, and council has repeatedly said that when it came to public comment, it would not infringe upon the public's right to be heard at the beginning of the meeting. So the question is, if you put the rule into place, there needs to be a consensus that your rules will be adhe adhered to. And if it's true that you truly do not want any comments and commendations, uh, excuse me, comments by city council during commendations, um, I know that hasn't been the case in practice, so I just need to have clarification on that. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. You know, two things, if I may, that we have one. Well, we have five. We have five members here. I thought we had four. Um, we may want to wait until we have a full council to discuss this. Uh, n number one. Number two, um, and, and we shouldn't spend a lot of time on this in, in, in terms of back and forth, but I think that the comments during commendations, I think limiting the number of commendations a council member can have, I think is fine. Um, but cutting off the comments, it would actually probably make it less special for the folks that are here. And I, and I, and I fail to see the connection between probably the two minutes that we spend talking during commendation. Um, and maybe the, as a matter of course, the chair can remind people, uh, council members, when you speak during commendations, uh, council members, please speak, keep, keep your uh, remarks limited. That, that's fine. But I, I, I just think saving those two minutes uh, does more detriment to the process than benefit to what we're trying to do here, in my opinion. But that being said, I do think we should have a full council to discuss this, my opinion. Thank you. And, and council, I'll also say to you that uh, I, I prepared a substitute with what was a, um, a Scrivener's error, but I did have the conversation with um, uh, the chief of staff this morning who had an excellent recommendation. I think all, all said and done, I think uh, I, I appreciate council's opportunity to have this talk and uh, a continuance then to have a full council would be in order. Sixteenth. Wow. Yeah, I, I think we can just finish this conversation now. Um, if folks want to come back, they can. Um, but, but just, uh, I, I'm fine with taking out the comment part and just leaving 
just doing three 10 minute presentations and calling it a day. So what you're saying is the way the motion was stated with no comment, is your preference to have that in there, or you want? Let me just let me direct. No, you. I'm saying take out the no comment. Part. Okay, and and what? And I, that way everybody's happy. Okay, and then what? It, here's what it actually, uh, based on what I had wanted to propose. It says, shall be scheduled a maximum of three commendations shall be scheduled on a regular meeting agenda with ten minutes afforded for each, with limited time allotted for council's comments. That's perfect. Okay, if that's council's pleasure, that's fine. Now, here's the other thing that we Ms. can Shelby, do today. Yes, sir. I, I could go along. I, I, I could go along with that, but every council member up here knows. Maybe I miss her today. There ain't no way in the world you're gonna have accommodation of police, and you telling me ten minutes. You ain't gonna tell me that. How many minutes did it take today for a police officer today? It wasn't no ten minutes. So we can do this by theory and have it in there, but I can tell you. You ain't going to get 10 minutes. Well, Mr. Goose, let me just say that in, in, in coordination with this, what this does was to remove the need for a separate commendation day to limit it to three commendations. Therefore, as a result of when this would be adopted, and by the way, by moving this resolution, you don't move it today. You just read it by title only. That's the way council's rules state. It comes back in two weeks anyway. So, but but okay, I didn't mean to show you, but what I'm saying is we reverted back. We had all police, fire, everybody on one separate day, and then we reverted back to start having police and fire come in, and we went off balance. There's no way in the world you're going to tell me if we, if we have three accommodations on one day, it's going to take us 30 minutes. There ain't no way possible. We've never done that. So I'm sorry to say we should have left it away from Virginia where we originally voted and had all those companies on one day, you could have as many as you want, and that would have been a day we'd have been done. But we reverted back and changed and changed our rules. So I, it doesn't matter to me. If I don't make a lot of accommodations, what I do, I make them for certain people. But whatever you want to do, I'll go with it. But I'm just saying this ain't gonna be adhered to because there's no way you're gonna get to 30 minutes of accommodation or three accommodations and to not have the council members talk. Ain't gonna happen. Anyone else? In, the in theory, this was a discussion of trying to limit our meetings. And it keeps going back to accommodations. Accommodations are supposed to be special. And I want to recognize people when they do something special. Fire, police, AT ATU, and other people that do something special for our community. But I do have to point out we have staff reports. Staff reports are supposed to be five minutes. We had one today that lasted for almost two hours. Accommodations should be last in the total poll. We should find other ways to cut down our meeting time. Uh, what is the pleasure of council on this? If I can just follow up, council. The other thing of significance in here is it, it permits uh, the continued use of communications media technology. Council has said in the past that it wanted to continue it. Uh, I didn't hear any words that were said to, to, to remove it or limit it. It, it, it. And whenever the discussion came up, it was always the council appreciated the continued support of communications media technology. And I believe, if I recall, have, have made that point um, in the past. So that's, that's in there, and unless, any, unless council wants to, uh, to discuss that at a future date. Um, so what it does is it, it removes the need for me to ask council to waive the rules because it's in there. The other thing that's, that's of significance is to, remove the, is to move the staff reports to, per the motion, um, after all the um, business, after, after other city business has been completed. So the staff reports take place after the um, uh, consent docket after the, um, all the um, uh, second reads, first reads, review hearings, and the like. And that would probably most mm -hmm. likely bring staff reports to the afternoon. If for whatever reason your calendar, your docket moves very quickly, it's very easy because it's not set for a time certain staff reports can be moved up. That's the real major change in terms of um, uh, the move towards efficiency. And, um, and I spoke with the chief of staff uh, about it. and. Um, uh, Staff is aware of it, and the staff has no objection to that if that's council's pleasure. 
So, council, again, if you wish to have a full council, <clears throat> you will have a full council back on the 16th. This process would take effect um, after the adoption of it, which would be after two readings of the title. So it's council's pleasure whether you want to wait for the full council to talk through this, and I can um, uh, um, make myself available, or you can read the title and have it come back on the 16th and do with it with council's pleasure at the time. Um. I would like to make the resolution. Second. Well, then if you could just read it by title and then ask it to return on the 16th of March. Pursuant to council's rules. Which one? 13 or 14? Uh, no, actually, no. It's the resolution itself. Resolution. The title hasn't changed. Resolution. It's the resolution itself. So uh, the one I passed out. Resolution. Okay. Uh, a resolution amending the rules of procedures governing meetings of the City Council of the City of Tampa, amending Rule 3, changing the order of business and conduct of regular meetings, permitting mo remote participation by a member who is physically not able to attend a meeting where a quorum is present, amending Rule 5, allowing for virtual participation of the public using communication media technology, CMT, amending Rule 6 regarding petitioner's requests for continuances of quasi-judicial hearings, allowing for virtual participation using CMT in quasi-judicial hearings, providing an effective date. And, and again, this is, a, this is a substitute based on a, uh, a, a minor change, which I will send out to council and to the administration, a hard cop, excuse me, electronically. Motion, if I may, I yes. want to clarify, if you may, Mr. Chair. Yes, one, one second, we have a motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by Councilman uh, Carlson. Any further discussion? Thank you, sir. A question for Mr. Shelby. So yes. the only thing this thing does, correct me if I'm wrong, with commendations is um, up to three a meeting, 10 minutes each. And I may have missed something. Long day. What it does is it, it makes administration update part of the rules. No more than 10 staff reports may be placed on an agenda. Mm -hmm. A discussion with the chief of staff raised a very interesting point, council, when you're getting close to... And if yeah. I may, and I apologize for cutting you off, for commendations. Commendations, yes, commendations say the following. A maximum of three commendations shall be scheduled on a regular meeting agenda with 10 minutes afforded for each with limited time for council comments. Presentations shall, be, shall each be afforded five minutes with five minutes additional for council comments, and that was per the motion. Okay, thank you, the sir. Only, the only difference was changing it from no comments to a, 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 a limited time allotted for council comments on the commendations. And, and with an understanding that it would remove the, spe the separate commendation day yes. on, the, on the second Tuesday. And we may want to explore the idea of limiting per council uh, in-person commendations later on a later other time, but that's it. Thank you. I, so what you've just done now, is, you got to be recognized, sir. Yes, Councilman Good. What you've just done now, if you're going to go back to this old way of doing it, yes. you're going to have a please, a fire, and an ATU. There are your three combinations. Mm, not always. And please, we can talk about Please, fire, and ATU. There are your combinations. So when we have these special presentation combinations, yes. we're going to recognize somebody. You, you won't get that. Won't you? I'm, so, that. I'm sorry, I don't. Because you don't always have three at the same time. Is that correct, no. Madam Clerk? It always, there's always room for at least one, at least one, if not two. <laughs> I like to say, I, and, I, and there was I, a discussion, I, and there was I, a discussion I, about I, offsite. I, I, I'll, I'll go along with it, but I'm just telling you that gonna be thrown out the window in six months. What do I tell you? Any other further discussion? Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, Mr. Shelby has changed the rules or procedures. <laughs> To, to accommodate some things. Uh, but again, 10 staff meetings. That's, and, that's. And, but my, my point is still going to be with the point I just made. And you then, can have 10 staff meetings, but if all of them last two hours each, when they're supposed to last five minutes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Now the motion again, you read it by title. And the, it did not, the resolution did not pass, but the motion, if I understand correctly, is to bring it back again for the second reading for 16. Thank you, Council. Now, I believe we're at agenda item number 18, file number E2023 H, Chapter 22. Hey, good afternoon, Council. I'm Gregory, Assistant City Attorney. 
This item is the first reading of a proposed ordinance to amend sections 22-276 and 22-291, updating the transportation technical manual to include additional standards um, from the National Association of City Transportation Officials. Basically, these standards are just an additional tool in the mobility department's toolbox to um, evaluate designs for sidewalks, bike lanes, et cetera. So I we're just here for first reading this week. Any, Any questions? questions? Any questions? Any questions for Mr. B. Day? Who would like to take the reading of this ordinance? Mr. Raglan Reed. Thank you. File number E2023-8CH22. Ordinance been presented for first reading consideration. An ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida, related to Chapter 22, Streets and Sidewalks, Article 3, Technical Provisions, amending Section 22-276, Technical Standards may be established, amending Section 22-291, Technical Standards adopted by replacing the 2009 edition of the Transportation Technical Manual with the 2003 edition, providing for repeal of all ordinance or parts of ordinance in conflict where providing for certainly providing an effective date. We have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Councilman Vieira, you have public safety. And I have no what items uh, do I move? I, I threw mine away. Well, I'm sorry, what? 19 through 22. Thank you. Uh, if I may, I move items 19 through 22. So moved. Motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Councilman Hurtek, you have Parks and Recreation. No, I mean, excuse me, Orlando, uh, uh, Councilman <laughs> Goods, you have Parks and Recreation. Oh, no. Well, I have 23. It's late. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, motion made by Councilman Goods, seconded by? Second. By Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Hurtak, you have par uh, Public Works. Yes, I move items 24 through 34. We have a motion made by Councilwoman Hurtak, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, Councilman Vieira. Yes, sir. You have Finance Committee. Thank you very much. I move items 35 through 39, so if I may. So we have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion passes. Councilman Carlson. Move items number uh, 40 through 47. So we have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, also moved by Councilman Goose. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any objection? Motion passes. Uh, Councilman Goose, you have transportation. Item 48 through 51, Mr. Chairman. You, Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Goose, seconded by Councilman Vera. All in favor say aye. 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 Agenda item number 52, I think, needs to be. Schedule for April 20th. So move. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item number 53. Move resolution. Second. We have a uh, motion made by Councilman Goods, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item number 54, file number F. DN 21-125-C. I need a motion to move the second, resolution. Second. A motion to move the resolution by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? And, lady and gentlemen, I believe that clears off our agenda. Uh, we have any information or reports? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, we did not make a motion to approve the agenda and the addendum. So, so moved. Make second. It, thank you. Motion to approve the agenda and the agenda by Councilman Vieira, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, information reports. Councilman Goods. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. It's kind of my attention to several citizens uh, and students in reference to our, what they call the Teens Leading Change Program. You know, we have the Mayor's Youth Corps uh, in Apparently, there seems to be an unbalance of equity with these two programs. Uh, come to find out that this program here, the kids are getting, uh, going out doing popcorn, getting donations, 
uh, versus the Mayor's Youth Court has a budget, my, my understanding is about $20,000. And I guess the gist of this thing became that the, the kids aren't being able to go on the field trips. As you know, the Mayor's Youth Court, they're going to the NLC, the National League of Cities. They've been to four legal cities. And apparently this group is consistently, consistently being left out uh, of uh, a lot of programs. I've always said I don't feel that there's the balance of the Mayor's Youth Court in this program is equally uh, distributed. Uh, you look at the uh, criteria of the Mayor's Youth Court, uh, I think it leaves out uh, kids. I may mention that before. Uh, I think it needs to be evaluated. When I look at the TLC program, look at the schools, the uh, centers that are, are uh, in this program, you're talking about Cyrus Green, Gwendolyn Miller, Jackson Height, Loretta Ingle, Oak Park. You do have uh, a Benito, uh, Holland Pines, uh, to me that's, that sends a message to me, uh, red flag. So I would like the administration to come forth to talk about these two programs with the two liaisons, the directors of these programs, and understand the uh, uh, budgetary, uh, 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 the budget uh, in these two programs. I heard there isn't one for TLC, but I want to find out and get a clear understanding of these two programs to make sure they're, they're equally uh, viable for the city uh, as it relates to our kids. We have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilwoman Hurtat. All in favor say aye. Aye. What date, what date do we have there? We'll, we'll give them time. We'll give them April. We have an April. Mm -hmm. April 6th staff reports. Um, April 6th staff reports. If, um, yeah. Full description of both the program so we can know what's going on. Is there any opposed? Motion passes. That's it, sir. Councilman Hurtak. Nothing for me. Councilman Vieira. A couple, if I may. First, we have that uh, public safety master plan coming. I wanted to make sure that council did a motion requesting that police and fire, uh, the unions, get a copy of it at least seven days before um, the, the meeting. So motion. Mm -hmm. Motion made by Councilman Vera. Seconded Change by council mention. Carlson, all in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? March 16th, I think. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Motion um, passes. Thank you very much. Next, I wanted to give off-site, potentially off-site, I may bring it on, I don't know, uh, Chief Judge Ronnie Figueroa for his service as Chief Judge. A commendation, sorry. No, he's no longer Chief Judge. Uh, judge Sabella, uh, they have a max of eight years, so Chris Sabella got on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a motion made by Councilman Vieira. Second. Second by Councilman Carlson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And, and thank you. Oh, sorry. And then off-site commendation. There's a nice gentleman I've known for a while named Alex Espinosa. It's actually, I'll tell you all the story, long story short. Uh, there was a woman in Tampa Palms who lost her dog, and there was a search for days and days. And Alex Espinosa, who I've been friends with for a while, is a retired lieutenant colonel in Tampa Palms. Um, his son and my son used to go to school together. Um, he was on the search for the dog, and, and he heard um, the dog's cries in, 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 uh, from far away, and he went into a swamp and you know, jumped into the, into the swampy water and, and wound up saving the life of the dog all by himself. So I was going to give uh, Alex a commendation on Saturday, if I may. Motion made by Councilman Vera, seconded by Councilman Carlson. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? And then lastly, the I wanted to. Oh, and then lastly, I wanted to bring a group, Coffee Uniting People Cup. Uh, they do. You may have seen them on social media. It's an organization that takes intellectually disabled people and and sets up hubs where they can sell coffee. Um, and I, and I want to work with the administration on seeing if we can get them set up in in the courtyard of the city of Tampa, maybe once a month or so. And as a way, and and the mayor knows about them well. She was over there recently. Greg Jones, who's a really good attorney and, and uh, active. I think he's a deacon at Bayshore Baptist. Fine, wonderful guy. Um, leads that up. And I wanted to have them on April 20th, if I may, uh, just for a short commendation uh, at City Council for their work. Just introduced them to you all before I make that request of council. Only one on site. Only one. I know, right? Uh, that's look. That's why I asked. I because I was going to use one, and I wanted to make sure. That's why I asked that. I don't see any on April twentieth. Of course, that'll have to change if the council wishes to go forward. Um, yeah, and there's none. I checked that before. Yeah. God forbid, right? We have a motion made by Councilman Vera, seconded by Councilman Carlson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Council.
Councilman Carlson. If I can, please, uh, on March 12th, Sunday, March 12th, there's going to be a life remembrance for uh, Rolando Rodriguez, who was a past fire marshal for the city of Tampa, and I would like to present a commendation posthumously. Slow. Okay, second, second, yes, second. Sorry. Thank you very much. Motion to receive and file. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Councilman Vieira. All in favor? Aye. All in favor? Aye. And before you go, Council, on the subject Any of commendations, opposed? there. Motion passes. There is no. A reminder there is no commendation meeting this Tuesday. Thank you.